at the end end of the day uh, and as i said uh, your, your theme of the college that i saw is really very apt that you are searching for meaning in the bits and pieces of life whereas i think this workshop is going to help you search for the meaning of physics in the bits and bytes that you you are, you will come to know from the uh, 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 the attempting uh, various computations as i said uh it's always uh, this workshop could not have been timed better because if you see uh ugc right now has introduced uh, in its curriculum a extensively computational based syllabus and this is tailored on python so it it could not have been better timed and i and this is really the foresight of your institute which actually speaks volumes about its leaders that they can gaze into the crystal ball into the future and prepare the students well in advance giving them a edge over their uh, uh, in this highly competitive field as i said i'll come to computation a bit later but uh, if you see we i come from an institute which is an inter university center of the ugc so our actually uh, name is ugc the consortium for scientific research where we hope to make available the mega science facilities of the da to the large pool of a uh, university research community and we at the kolkata center have a very special task cut out for us is to address or cater to the northeastern region and in this sense we have been organizing conferences at manipur uh shillong and at uh, 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 state of nagaland so this is really a very good opportunity for me to come and speak to you and i hope that we this will open a doorway to the uh, to the collaboration between you and us where the researchers can use and the most important thing to understand all our facilities are available to the university researchers free of cost you do not have to pay for a characterization facility in fact we support your travel and we also support a small amount of student uh, a fellowship for 3 years if a project is approved but if you want to use our facilities for one time you just have to write to us we take care of course in this uh, uh, testing time we have not been able to extend uh, much of our support but we will soon be restarting it so our we are always open we have uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, we have a chemistry department physics department biology computational things so you are always welcome and i hope that we this will give us an opportunity to start a new beginning so and, and of course the computations have now really gained uh, by leaps and bounds and have become an integral part and the other day i was giving a talk to 12 standard students as to why they should be taking up basic science as their career option i stress that physics chemistry biology today has an underlying tone of computation which makes them ready for the daily challenges ahead in their real world so if you have ever many of our students have in fact started uh, doing uh, after doing the doctoral degree in physics chemistry have gone on to do extremely well in the field of computation so this is really an opportunity which you should also uh, be keep uh, that that's uh, the 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 spin off you get for doing basic science and as i can see dr barua has been a uh, uh, expert who she gazes at the stars and as i said both the physics and humans are made in the heaven, in the sky so it is always a privilege to come here and talk to you as well i should apologize to father reverend jose that when i was doing my schooling i did my schooling from uh, st paul's in uh, mumbai don boscos would usually be our rivals uh, in in the football Okay, so I, sorry, I, 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 who would win? But as I said, it's always a privilege to come back to an elite educational institution which builds up the foundations of humanity. And of course, once you are a good human being, you are obviously going to get educated. So, in fact, I should thank you all for giving me this opportunity to be present in that very elite institution. Of course, I, I, I just learned that uh, 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 Father Mabley was the first principal of the college in Northeast who got the NAC uh, credential. So that really speaks volumes for the organizational capacity. 
and it's and in fact there's something that we can learn from uh, by associating with so it's always a pleasure and a privilege and of course uh, parag i think attended one of the conferences we had, we had organized and that's how we came to know and uh, uh, what is interesting about dr day is that i think he has he has, he has tried to uh, as a physicist to talk to technologists and try to make the technology guys understand physics and that in that sense he gets the best of the bowl best world so with this i hope you are going to have a fun filled uh, a learning experience <coughs> for the next 2 3 days so happy computational to you all and, and let's hope this journey in the field of computer is as interesting as the journey would take to the future state of assam of course i have travel to i have travel to uh, uh, guwahati several times on my way to 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 kaziranga so now i'll definitely make a stop and try to spend some time with you thank you and i really look forward to this wonderful workshop thank you thank you very much sir for your kind words it was really interesting uh, to yeah no uh, the deep interest you have in our university and then uh, yeah definitely uh, let this be the beginning of a new collaboration between uh, our university who it can uh, get so much from your institute sir thank you very much for your words and then uh, going ahead uh, let me now invite uh, the head of department of the physics department dr samrat day to give us the highlights of the activities of uh, the department of physics Dr. Samrat, thank you, Amor, uh, and um, welcome all the participants. I thank you for choosing this workshop, and I also thank the university for always encouraging us to go ahead with this type of workshops and other events. And my special thanks to Dr. Gugre, and thank you very much, sir, for your offer of assistance for different scientific collaborations we hope that will be benefited from you and uh, for your kind information our university just um, lies somewhere in between guwahati and kaziranga where you went so next time you come definitely you visit our university that will be a privilege for us to have you here um regarding the activities that physics department has been organizing to tell you the truth it will take at least one hour of time to speak about all the activities that we have done for last two years or so it has really become our heavy to organize at least two or three workshops every year one national conference every year and uh, we have been very successful in organizing those events our main motto is to help our own students and also the students of other areas of northeastern region and uh, we have been lucky enough to have their confidence in us so i am not going to speak on the past events that we already had but i am just going to highlight two of our events that will be happening in the month of february one event will be science academy's refresher course sponsored by all the three science academies for theoretical physics and their and the dates will be from 1st to 16th of february and uh, we are also thankful to science academies for choosing our university to have this refresher course which is of course a very rare event in northeast india and also we are having one international conference in um, on uh, five different sub themes and that will be held on the last week of february itself and this is in collaboration with indian association of physics teachers so both indian association of physics teachers and assam don bosco university we are jointly organizing this international conference and uh, i inform all the participants who are present here including the speakers to spread this information to your friends and colleagues we hope that those in events will also be successfully organized coming back to this event um mr parag bhattacharji has been working this computational physics workshop for last Two years. This is a third one. This is the third one, yes. and um, he has been an expert in this field. And uh, he recently attended one of the computational physics workshops where Dr. Gugre was there as a resource person, and he actually mentioned that it will be a it will be an opportunity for us to listen to him. And that's how 
where we are now, Dr. Gugde with us. And I welcome him once again, and I welcome all the participants <coughs> once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Samra, uh, for the enlightening us with the activities of the department, especially which is coming ahead, and then so that we can look forward to it. And as we go ahead, let me request the convener of this workshop, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Parag Bhattacharya, to give an overview of this online workshop on computational physics 2020 using Python. Mr. Parag. Thank you, Dr. Amma. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, yes, Parag, yes. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to just um, make a brief correction to what uh, Dr. Samrat had said. He called me an expert. I, do, I disagree with that. I'm not an expert. Uh, as a kid, I used to love taking apart my toys. Uh, I'm still that same kid. I just like to take apart uh, things and just learn this, this curiosity which is leading me to Python. So that's the reason. Okay, So I'm not really an expert. I'm just trying to find my way over here. And uh, whatever way I have found so far, the idea of this workshop is only to share that with uh, the students and everybody who's interested or learn. So now uh, coming to this workshop, uh, this is the third such uh, workshop in this particular series called as Workshop on Computational Physics. Uh, the first workshop was in 2018. And uh, that year we had uh, done this workshop using MATLAB and New Octave because I was not, uh, I did not know uh, uh, Python at that in 2018 at that time. Then uh, a couple of years ago, after that workshop, I was introduced to Python by uh, one of my students from engineering. I used to teach uh, BTEC students in the Azara campus. And uh, one of the students from uh, the computer science department, he introduced me to uh, Python. In fact, he had introduced me to many other things also, like such, such as Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So he told me about Python. And then uh, I felt a little curious and I started exploring about Python. And then we realized that, OK, the same thing can be actually done, the, the workshop which we had done. So uh, we, the very next uh, uh, workshop, which was in 2019, the workshop on computational physics 2019, we had it using Python, but we used the Python IDE in, uh, for that particular workshop. So what has happened to me is uh, work coding in Python, it started first as a hobby, but now it has turned into a, a serious tool really for me. And, uh, I, I uh, if, from my perspective, I, I found Python to be more like a friend. I, I used to do a lot of coding when I was like uh, from my class 11 from that time. I used to do a lot of coding. I had done, I'm basically a C++ person. I, I had done a lot of coding in C++. So when I got introduced to, uh, to Python, C++ is if you think of programming languages like uh, people. So C++ was like a mentor, okay? But I found Python to be more like a friend. Okay, and when I code in Python, it was like uh, having a casual chat with a friend. Okay, so for me, Python was basically like it's just a friend. I'm just having a casual chat with a friend. And uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Samrat had mentioned, I had also, and Dr. Kukri had also mentioned about that particular workshop that this year, which was held in, by, it was organized by the Victoria Institution College in Kolkata. Uh, and uh, in that uh, workshop, uh, Dr. Kugre was the resource person. So when I attended that workshop, my perspective towards uh, Python had changed. So, so far, like I said, um, I, it was working with Python was like having a casual chat with a friend. And when I attended this workshop and I realized that I can also have a serious discussion with the same friend. So uh, that's when you know I started really uh, exploring Python seriously and then tried to use it in my own research work also. And I found that it really makes my job a very a whole lot easier. So as a scientist, I find it uh, really uh, helpful because it gives me time to focus on the problem at hand rather than on the specifics of the coding part. And this year, the, uh, this particular workshop being online, it also gives us uh, the opportunity to focus on topics which are of some really specific use to all of us as uh, scientists. So this time we are going to focus on uh, packages such as uh, NumPy, Matplotlib. And if time permits, uh, there's a very exciting package called as Pandas. So maybe I'll introduce you to that also. And uh, for that, and just uh, so as to drive the point that uh, using Python, you can you focus more on the problem and less on the the, the specifics on the on the on the details of how to do the programming. So we're going to use instead of the Python IDE, we're going to use something called as a Jupyter notebook. 
the my uh, talk in the uh, first uh, technical session after the keynote address will basically introduce you to the Jupyter notebook. So uh, let me just uh, show you uh, the schedule. You all have already seen uh, how the schedule looks like. So I'll just uh, share it here so that I can just go through these just briefly. Alma, just let me know if you're able to see my screen. <laughs> yes, but it's loading. Okay. Yeah, we can yeah. see. We can see now. All right. So this is basically the program. So for each page, it gives you the program for that particular day. So uh, and in this schedule, you'll also find out in the third column, you'll find out the Google Meet link. So these Google Meet links, we are going to use the same Google Meet link for this that particular session. So uh, right after this inauguration, we'll have the talk by uh, Dr. Sandeep Khogre. And that will be followed by a brief presentation by me on uh, how to go about using the Jupyter Notebook. And then we will break for lunch from 12 to 1 o'clock. And from 1 to 3.30, I will uh, introduce you to the elements of Python. So how to get started working with Python. And uh, all the resources from today, from, from day one, that is today, it is made available. It will be made available to, to you at the end of the day on this link. So it's this, this is basically a, sh a shared Google Drive. You just click on this. It will take you to a Google Drive. And over there, you'll find all my files, all the Python notebook files, all the resource files, everything you'll find in that location. So you can just go to this link, and you can download for today's work. Then uh, that will be the end of the sessions for today. Tomorrow, on the first technical session, that is technical session three, we will have a talk by Dr. Samrat De, the head of the Department of Physics at Assam Dombosky University. He will be introducing you to the fundamentals of numerical analysis. And uh, he will be followed by me again. Uh, I will be showing you how to do uh, physical computations, how to, how to take a physical problem and then uh, perform computations using Python. And then uh, we'll have a break. And then uh, we'll follow it by uh, taking some actual examples and then working uh, on this. Because the best way to learn Python is actually to solve a problem. So we will be taking a lot of problems and we'll be solving them in the session after lunch tomorrow. And just like uh, today, all the resources that we, have, that we use in tomorrow's session will be available in this link. Then uh, that will bring the second day to a close. And after that, uh, the third day, we have only just one session. The first session in the first uh, technical session of the third day, that is technical session five, we will have applications of Python. OK, we'll continue with where we had stopped in the previous day. That will be followed by a quick question answer session by myself and uh, the my other resource person, a person who is Dr. Samrat Day. And that will be followed by the valedictory function. And all the resources from the third day will again be made available on this link. So that's basically the in brief how the program how the program schedule for this particular workshop goes. So uh, to uh, to finally to uh, talk about what to expect from this workshop, uh, you need to uh, know that this workshop is not meant to be a full course on Python because to learn Python uh, to master Python you need years actually to know in and out of Python. So this workshop is not meant to be a full course. It is merely meant to be like an appetizer for uh, which will tell you that there are better things to come. So I hope uh, this work workshop will inspire uh, all of you to get started with Python coding. And uh, it will make you realize that coding in Python is, um, is also one of the means of expression for the scientist in you. So with this, I would like to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parag, for taking us through the uh, activities of this workshop. Uh, I think yeah, it's going to be really exciting. I even yeah, I'm really excited about the things, and then like the Hello? OK, sorry, there was a technical problem. So uh, yeah, with this, we have come to the end of the inaugural session. But before we end, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the organizing committee to thank the vice chancellor of this university, Father Stephen Mowgli, for his encouragement on all these activities.
And also, <clears throat> let me take this opportunity to thank the Register of our University for being with us and addressing the gathering here. And I'm also, we are also grateful to the Director of uh, School, uh, School of Fundamental and Applied Sciences, Dr. Manmayuri Barua, as well as the head of Department of Physics Department, Dr. Samrat Day, and all the faculties present here, as well as the participants. Thank you very much. So with this, we have come to the end of the inaugural session. But <clears throat> Uh, immediately now, we will continue with the keynote address by Dr. Sandeep Gugre, who is from UGC, CS, uh, UGC DAE CSR, which is Consortium for Scientific Research. This is like a bridge between universities and Department of Atomic Energy. Department of Atomic Energy being a research-oriented organization have lots of scientific tools with them which universities will not, be, uh, uh, will not be in a condition to have it. So this consortium for scientific research is a bridge between universities to get avail the facilities of DA. So this is a very, I mean, uh, it's a very uh, novel concept that the facilities are made available to the universities. And as Sir has already said, he will, uh, he is also very much interested in our university. So hope we can make use of the uh, facilities available in UGC DAE CSR Kolkata in future. So may I invite the keynote speaker, Dr. Sandeep Gure, to address, give the uh, keynote address to the gathering here. Hello, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, as I said, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to come and talk to students and of course share with them the excitements that we have encountered. So as I said, uh, Let me start, just give me a minute. Yeah. Uh, is my screen uh, uh, visible? Hello? Yes, sir, it's visible. Yes. It's visible. Said, uh, if somebody has any questions, one of you can just volunteer to look at the chat box and then you can always stop me. Uh, as and when uh, you have uh, uh, the, the questions. As I said, this is intended to be a dialogue uh, uh, rather than a formal uh, inaugural talk. So you can always try to stop me and, and we can uh, uh, have, have a, uh, uh, a dialogue rather than just a, just a monologue. So as I told you, uh, computations as, are an integral part of any basic research. As I said, in physics, the various branches, mechanics, condensed matter, atomic and nuclear, uh, electronics, each one of them has an underlying computational tone to it, which really prepares you to look at the problem, gather the tools you need to analyze it. And as, and as Parak said, the very fact he admitted that he's not an expert and he's a learner, itself shows that he really has acquired knowledge where you really uh, are, uh, about the entire topic where it makes you more humble uh, 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 the, rather than boasting about it. And the beauty about Python is, as you rightly said, it's a friend, it's a friend in need, it's a friend who sees you through your, your difficulties. And for me as a student, quantum mechanics and mathematical methods still give me nightmares. So let me today try to tell you how you can try to befriend these two demons, which really um, give, I used to give me sleepless nights uh, 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 the, before the exam, uh, problems in SOM series for my Fourier analysis or maybe graphics for quantum mechanics. Let me try to tell you how Python will try to be make yeah, more friendly to you and you slowly start looking at why things happen or the numbers that you get, do they really make sense? So it may get you thinking in an overall manner, which is really very important to look at the totality of the situation you are in and make the best use of the resources you have and come out uh, with the uh, required solution. So as I said, uh, I plan to do, I do not know how much time will uh, will permit, but as I said, uh, we had this workshop 
and I so I'm sure uh, Parag has the has the material from that workshop, and he can share it with uh, with you all because that is the main uh, uh, building block of the open source movement that we have. That we don't keep anything locked up in, in our cupboards, but we we have uh, we always free to share and distribute them so that everybody benefits from them in 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 the long run. So uh, as I said. All physical, chemical, biological, engineering sciences are and have a predominantly experimental sciences, and therefore computations become a part and 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 parcel. Whether you need it, you love it, you hate it, it's always there. And basically, all the computation can be uh, be split up into these basic three things. Any experiment would have would need you to acquire data. Once you have acquired this data, you would need to look at it, analyze it, process it. As some of my friends call it, we do the characteristic data massaging, and then we try to visualize it in a manner that which I can derive some results out of it. And last but not the least is of course the manuscript preparation because that's the end goal of any research activity. You need to have a paper at the end of your uh, uh, of your work. Uh, the, uh, the otherwise you are uh, really in for a, a difficult time when, when your boss questions you as to what you have been doing. So all these three things can be beautifully done using Python, as I will try to show you. Now, if I look at the ways when I started my own PhD career way back in 1990s at the then what was called the Nuclear Science Center, this was the kind of a huge data acquisition system we had, which was called the DECWACS. And if you guys need to know the history of DECWAC, our railway online reservation was actually built on the VMS. The, the operating system was a VMS, and that is one which brought in the railway reservation system. And this was actually the compact disk. It's a 50 GB compact disk on which I stored my data for the first time. And this was a prized possession which would be kept by the system administrator locked in his hip. In his cupboard, and whenever I needed to analyze the data, I had to go beg, borrow, steal from him, put it on, and read the analysis. So, as I said, today I think my son's iPod has has a two gig, uh, two TB of uh, data for him to store his song. Whereas my first experiment, I, I this was what we had was a 50 GB price possession of and the entire experimental data went on this. So if you looked at the data analysis in the good old days, this is what I'm saying when because all of us who are doing basic science at the end of the day aspire for a career in research or development. So if you saw in the good old days, this is what were the tape drives on which we put data. This was the, the digital wax system was the main breadbone for any large scale experimental facility. We had to literally be present in the lab 24-7. Lab was our actual second home because uh, we had to sit down, access the tape drives, sort the data, resort it. In fact, just to give you a fact, what took me seven days of computation today is done by my PhD student in less than half an hour. So that's the kind of advancements we have made in computations, which has made not necessarily life easy, but at times has taken out the fun from doing things. Because when we were in the lab, you'll see. Most of us would spend time, have coffee together, chit chat, and suddenly decide, ah, oh, there's a good movie, let's go and make. So the human aspect was much more there in the olden days technology than it is there today. So everything comes with a price. As they say, there are no free lunches. And the end, if you see, uh, you, you may be wondering what I'm saying. This were the tools for us to make manuscripts. This was what we would use to trace our graphs on a tracing paper. We had to run behind draftsmen, plead, uh, borrow, uh, 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 bribe them with a uh, uh, with a cup of tea or coffee and have your graphs and make ready for manuscript preparation. So it was really a laborious job. The software resources then there were all proprietary. You had to pay for it. In fact, Unix was patented to at and so they had VMS, the Deck Ultrix, they had SGI. These were all proprietary operating systems. You had proprietary software, which was Fortran, Pascal, C. And there was entire proper, it was a locked door technology in those days. We needed dedicated graphics terminal to do our analysis. You had to book them beforehand. And if you had to wait in queue for maybe months together. Of course, what has not changed is the manuscript preparation in LaTeX, 
which was still there, it has been made a bit more easy. So these were the software resources when we started. And the real game changer came in with the advent of personal computer, the desktop and laptop, which became affordable. Previously, in our days, we had to sit in the institute and do our analysis on the mainframe. But now, with the availability of the personal computer and open source, these together going hand in hand, you had you did not have to spend a single Mayapaisa to have a proprietary OS. A Windows Home Edition costs around six to seven thousand, but a Linux comes free. So the availability of open source, thanks to the guy Linus uh, who, who actually made the revolutionize the entire uh, computational field, we were able to have affordable computational power right on at with me. So nowadays the students are rarely seen in lab. Their, their computer centers have disappeared, and mostly they are uh, they have been replaced by by tables where students sit with their laptops and do the analysis that is because of these two and of course it has but the the main uh, besides this open source development it was the development in toolkits which has made the real game changer so it was the common confluence of availability of open source resources and toolkits which has opened up the entire new vista now what do i mean by toolkit now, we obviously know in computers, there's something called the 1090 rule. This was the basis when they got the risk, the reduced instruction set computer is the 1090 rule. 10% of the instructions are used 90% of the time, and 90% of the instructions are used 10% of the time. So all that we need to do most of the time is read our data, do some processing, and then visualize the data and prepare publication, good quality publication uh, graphs and figures. All these three things can be done. And of course, I am not an expert in, in, in computers. I always had problems whenever you went to com conventional programming languages, such as Fortran, C, C++, they are meant for experts. They are meant for professionals. A layman like me, is really at a, at a, because then I suddenly realize if I want to do an addition of two numbers, I have to define what is A, I have to define what is B, is it integer, is it real, then I have to define what is C and take care of all the syntaxes and nitty gritties which really scares us. So the toolkit is something which knows that you are not an expert programmer, it, make, it knows you are going to make silly mistakes and it corrects for you automatically. So that is the main advantage of toolkit. They are not rigid as the conventional programming languages. And obvious, and if they are extremely flexible and user friendly, you really can learn them off the net in a day or two. And most important is there's an extensive collection of libraries with algorithms for doing anything and everything that you need to do. As, 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 as Paraga said, numpa, these are all called packages in the language of Octave and Python. They are all called packages. So you have some good uh, kind-hearted soul doing, uh, uh, doing you a favor by developing all the tools and putting them online. And most important is they are available for all major operating systems. Previously, people thought open source was only restricted to Linux. Of course, I may love or hate Bill Gates, but nowadays the Windows operating system has almost become a free operating system. It's become an affordable operating system. You should definitely not have, I do not advocate privacy, but definitely a decent Windows operating system is affordable within the reach of any student pursuing his any research. And therefore, once you have the Windows operating system, there are several free softwares available for Windows. And this was an emphasis where, which was put to me by uh, my our then director, that if you need to develop some tools for the use of colleges, it has to be on a Windows platform, which is more user friendly rather than Linux, which really needs some amount of knowledge of system administration. And at the end, as we always use call them, you become a more of a system misadministrator rather than an administrator. Uh, am I audible? Everything is fine? or? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So then, because this uh, 
virtual platform and gives you the advantage that the other person or the other may also doze off and you you would really not know so that's why i just need to keep on checking to make sure that at least a few souls are around and listening to me uh, for and as i say so that's why so anytime you have any problem you can just always uh, interrupt me so basically we in fact as 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 parak said we actually started our journey with octave because we had lot of engineering students come and do projects with us and they would always use matlab and matlab pleases your pocket to the nth level so we found out that octave was a poor man's replica uh, substitute for for matlab and we started with octave and then slowly migrated to python also we found out that since ugc has now hardwired python into curriculum many of our research scholars who went back and started teaching in colleges they always came back they, they have kept in touch with us and they came back to us that sir we are having some problems can you help us uh, uh, develop a code in octave in python and then they started doing more of python so that's how we are in python merely by the uh, the the in response to the difficulties faced by our students and in fact the uh, workshop that parag uh, mentioned was one of the students wrote back to us that we have heavily we have they have converted the entire course a uh, computer uh, quantum mechanics into computational quantum mechanics can you just help us with python and then we started uh, trying to help him and that's how the entire workshop has 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 evolved so as i said uh, we will try to look at python which is a toolkit which makes up for all my fallacies and shortcoming it knows where i'm going to make mistake and then tries to correct so now let me tell you or run you through the what is a python and how is it helpful and since this is really kind of a uh, first lecture where i'm not going to be that technical i can afford to tell it to you in the in a story form so let me tell you the story of the rc circuit in an rc circuit which is the most innocuous looking subject that we look but it teaches you almost the basics of computation that you would want to know for example we all know that yes i have an rc circuit i have a capacitor it stores charge it blocks dc so what i can do is if i start charging this i apply a voltage let us say 5 volts across an rnc the voltage will rise up exponentially we all know that that is the textbook level knowledge we have now let me try to tell you how python will help you understand the nitty gritties of this entire effort as i said i know the voltage across a capacitor at a time t is given by this relation so basically what you like to do in your experiment is apply a fixed voltage and then measure the voltage across the capacitor now this actually i am following that uh, the first uh, workshop i gave a second workshop where i then dealt with actual experiments and we had an experiment where i can measure this again using open source tools and techniques we use arduino the microcomputer uh, controller to do record the growth of voltage across a capacitor and we recorded the time and voltage format so i am not going into that experimental detail but let's say there was a good friend of yours who said oh look here i have a file it's an ascii file and ascii file is a human readable file where i have stored the time and the voltage across a capacitor so, so i had 1 second it was 0 2 second it went to 0.5 volt 3 second 0.75 so on and so forth so now i have this file can you help me look at this data as i said most of the time what we have to do is read the data and plot the data so that is a simple thing and people who have done uh, the conventional programs would come and first ask you okay you have a data can you tell me the data format is it a two column data is it a three column data is it so what is it real numbers what is the delimiter so on and so forth and then you say you had enough of it and you are not going to uh, do anything more to help it but if you have python as i said python has several packages which does all these things for you at the back of your head and so what it does is i have the data stored in a file so i just Uh, there is a file data rc dot text which has this ascii file one line of it reads in the entire data you do not need to know 
what was the format how many columns were there nothing you just give this command the computer will go and read you know most of the time data are stored in columns so it will put it in data colon dot suppose it was a two column data it will automatically this simple command will pull it out into two columns data colon 0 data colon 1 if there were three it would be data colon comma 2 so and so forth so without knowing anything somebody gets a file tells you it's an ascii file separated by maybe tab one single line will be able for you to pull it out and read it once you have this data pulled out as i said anybody who does c or fortran can immediately see the power of python it has in c you would have to know the number of lines that are there what was the format you have to initialize arrays so you had to know what was the length and so on and so forth but one single line has got you the data in x and y column a simple command like plot data this was the x this is y you have an xy plot that is shown here so in the simplest sense you have been able to read a data file without knowing the format of the data if you go and tell this to people who have actually handled data format they will they will really be amazed that the amount because unless you know the data format you cannot read a data in c or fortran of course i have been limited to c and fortran so that's why i keep on repeating this but here is an example you know you have an ascii data just read it the program does all these things for you so now you have done this fine your friend is not happy he says now i want to see i know what is the value of r and what is the value of c now you have given me this data but how am i convinced that this data is what it should look like the next question the answer to this question is oh well i know the value of r i know the value of c i have i know the value of time because it's a time stamp data and i know what was my v not so then let me calculate the value of the voltage as a function of t so all that you do is is something like this now this is blasphemous in, in conventional for in any language you cannot define a dimensionless array but then the program knows that you are not an expert you do not know most of the thing so it does all the you can define a dimensionless array a blasphemous thing in conventional computer languages so what i will do is i have two arrays defined to store the voltage theoretical voltage across a capacitor and the voltage across a resistor so i just read in there as i told you i have able to strip it into column so i just call them x time y time i'm sure you this you will do more and more when you start doing it but just these are exercises to show you what you can do with python then i just do this calculations we in my uh, this was the these are the various voltages that you are calculating so you calculate vn exponential x time divided by rc you will get all this kind of thing you do the calculation and then you go and you see it beautifully fits your experimental data so you have immediately been able to visualize the data you are able to do some calculations now and present to the user the calculations with what you expect and what you get and that is what an entire exercise is supposed to mean and as 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 i said you are able as a, you are, we try to calculate the voltage across the resistor which will be falling down you try to calculate the theoretical voltage and then you try to do various kinds of things as i said uh, so, uh, some of the programs may not because we keep on tinkering with them but this tells you v in minus uh, that's actually the voltage there will be i always like to write v0 minus v0 into this so that has certain advantages i will come to it in a later so you are basically calculating what is the expected voltage at a given time if you know the value of r and c and you try to calculate it. so what you did was you gave your friend the voltage it predicted and what was the theoretical voltage you get fine 
you have, so what you have done for your friend is you have been able to show the data he got you have been able to do some calculation and show him but now your friend is still not happy he says look i want to i know that the voltage across suppose your friend has got you a data which is the voltage across a capacitor in an rc circuit he does not know the value of r or c he knows one of them but he does not know the other so but so how can you help him so the uh, he comes to you and tells look i need your help and i know one of the values can you help me predict the value of the other one so common sense tells you that you have a functional form like this the functional form was the voltage across a capacitor is v0 minus v0 e uh, by t by rc so what you will tell him is okay i know the functional form i have this data can i fit this data to this functional form well of, of course i need to know the time the time since i have measured it i have a, a handle on time so what i do is the experimental data which is absolute truth our interpretation may change over time but not the data uh, data that's your absolute truth in the truest purest form so what you would do is say, okay i know the functional form the uh, or the functional form the data has i know one of the variables time let me try to predict for you the tau so what you would do is you would go and say okay this is the data i have x and y let me fit the data to v0 minus v0 exponential minus t into tau or t into 1 by rc so the data that i have should be fitted into this form there are mathematical school to do it i am not going into the details but if you are able to have a data to tell the data that this is the functional form it should follow it is able to fit it and give you the value of these unknowns so what i do is is these are called least square fits so you do a least square fit by using one simple line in python you tell it i need to fit the x and y that is time versus voltage data into a functional form which is defined as v0 minus v0 e to the power minus t into tau you provide it all these unknowns you will be able to find out the value of a b and c a and b should be exactly identical that is why i like to write it in this form so you can be able to fit the given a data if you know the functional form the data is to follow you can fit it and calculate your unknown and then just a simple one line program where you give it the x data the y data you tell it what is the functional form and then you are able to to see to get the fit once you have the fit you will get the value of tau which is unknown you have to know r or c you can calculate the other so your friend what got to an a uh, uh, time versus voltage data you are able to plot it for him you are able to calculate it theoretically for him you also fitted the data to a known functional form and then told him what was the value of r c so you have increased the complexity of the problems you would face in your laboratory of course i assume most of you are new to python i am sure at the end of the workshop you would be familiar with most of these and these are the small things that you will find it very useful when you do your laboratory sessions or you do your actual numerical calculations for your quantum mechanics or all mathematical methods so as i said the simple rc circuit which is so innocuous we really don't spend enough time about it can teach you the various routine things that you need to do in your lab
now as i said let us further increase the complexity somebody comes and questions you look up guy how do you know that it should follow this functional form as i said you start questioning yourself you start questioning the data you have taken and try to make sure whatever you you have a feel that okay this is a data it should look the very fact when you plotted it you knew aha it has to be an exponential rise it looks like it then you did a theoretical calculation from a known functional form and you saw it fitted then you try to fit the data and get one or more unknowns you see everything is fine now you have asked the ultimate question the how do i know that this is the equation that the voltage across a capacitor has to follow we all know that this is a first order differential equation so i have an equation where whose initial value is unknown so these are known as ordinary first first order differential equation i'm really not going into what is first order what is ordinary what is in ordinary but let us suppose you have an equation with you what you do is you will divide the entire interval into equi distant points and calculate the value at each subsequent point so that xn is equal to x0 plus n so you try to discretize a given function and there are various methods you have to solve these equations uh, you will be familiar with one of them is the euler method and what we do in euler method is you try to find out the value of y1 is equal to y0 plus h the h was where i have done the difference between the points and using its value at the previous location they these are called there are implicit methods there are explicit methods i'm not going to do it but you know that the voltage across a capacitor can be written in form of a first order differential equation which is dq by dt v minus q by c by r and now you need to solve it so there are as, as you know that a differential equation can be solved using mathematical techniques one of them being the euler technique and this is how you would write a program to do a solution of differential equations using euler you see i wrote y was equal to y not plus h into fx not y not so what i do of course i need to know the initial values i know v not was 5 the initial value of the voltage across the capacitor was zero so i wrote a differential equation and using euler's method when i broke it into equidistant steps i was able to calculate it so then once i have this solution i plot it so what i did was i said oh i know that the voltage across a capacitor is the solution of a first order differential equation i knew the equation v minus v y by vt by c divided by r the equation is here i have to solve this using there are various methods you you must have studied them euler the runga kutta frank nicholson so and so forth but euler's is the simplest and i can solve it by calculating the value at i at the present step from the value known at the previous step and lo and behold you see this was the data that i had given you and this is the solution of the differential equation using the euler so starting from all the basics that you need as i said do not be scared as to how i have done it there is no black magic or witchcraft in it it's a simple plain python programming which i'm sure uh, parag will uh, i will introduce to you and dr dev will will talk to you about the underlying numerical method but as i said the simple rc circuit i read and plotted the data for my friend i did the theoretical plots i fitted the data to the known functional form and i also derive the functional form that it should follow all using python so this tells you the power of python that you have each of this is a building block once you have them you are able to do everything and you are able to put these various building blocks together and then build up a comprehensive understanding of the entire process involved as i said i have slowly increased the complexities from a simple read and plot to actually doing some calculations to doing some fitting 
because most of the time you'll see you'll have your data somebody will come and tell you the functional form you fit the data to that form and then derive the unknown or you could also solve the equation so this is a story of rc circuit which tells you most uh, various level of complexities that you can handle using pipe now once you have the data most of us have faced the problem of representing the data we need to represent it so that we can derive because data is a bunch of numbers what you make out of it depends critically on how well you are able to represent it so represent what you do is once you have the data many a times you have x and y data as i told you you had the data or time and voltage now if your data is reliable and correct it should have a predictive power you you should be able to predict what would be the outcome at a point where you have not performed the measurement that is the main emphasis of doing any experiment doing an experiment the results should be able to give you a crystal ball to gaze into a scientific future or scientific past depending on where you are looking at it so given an xy data set you need to derive a model you know that if i have, most of the time we know that all phenomena in nature are are linear if one banana cost to 10 rupees two bananas should cost to 20 rupees now if you go to a big bazaar or a, a, a big basket they may have put in some discount which are slight deviation from the linearity but everything in life most of the time is linear so if i have a data set x and y i can model a equation of a straight line y is equal to mx plus c so i have the values of x and y there is a mathematical trick called the least square approximation where i can derive the values of m and c which will represent a fit to my data so what i do is i perform the measurement at certain x and y and then i try to model them so that i can predict what would be the value of y at a point x where the measurement has not been done this is known as a least square fit it is if you have to do a least square fit using any conventional program you will have to know x you need to know sum of x you need to know sum of x square you need to know sum of xy and there are these equations now uh, if you remember i i forgot to mention one thing the whole the holy book for any computational physics is something called uh, data analysis by bevington now uh, if you look up the latest edition of bevington is scary there was an old 1970s edition which is about 100 and 150 pages if you find that book in the old chor bazaar please buy it and keep it that book which is a, a very small in fact it's not even a4 size it's half the size of a4 and about 200 pages it teaches you all the tricks of numerical method if you read the latest edition of bevington you are going to get scared so if you see that there are several methods on uh, to do this but if you have your friend python it does it for you i all i need to give it x and y and tell it i need to fit a straight line to it it will be able to do a least square fit to the data without you really bothering to know what it is once you have done the fit you then basically so that uh, it gives you this is the functional form you will have fit 1 and fit 0 which represent my sorry mx Let's see. So one of them is f uh, f zero and one of them is f one. So then, once you have this, you can see that at a given value of x, using the value of y and c, well, how does that equation look like? So this is a simple linear fit to the data you can do in a line. So the, if I give it two, it will fit it to a second order polynomial. If you know that if you have, if for example the uh, when you drop a ball. S is equal to half uh, ut plus half gt square. If I drop it, u is zero. So I have s is equal to half gt square. 
So if I have a form, if I know S and I know T, T, I can fit it to a, a second order. If I know S, I know T, I fit it to a second order thing. I'll be able to calculate the value of acceleration due gravity and experiment, which is that at your BSc. So this is how. Hello. Yeah. Are there any questions so far, or anything that I? Hello. Yes. Yeah. You are audible. No, no. Any questions or anything that I need, or I can carry on. Uh, you can please carry on. Yeah. So this is how you have done. This was your data, and this is the fit you get. You plot it, and you see. It. As I said, it is. Uh, it may be looking too much of uh, of a job for the people who are not exposed to Python. But let me assure you that by the end of this workshop, all this would start making sense to you. As I said, the other thing is you have a set of data. You really need to present it and look at what are the meaningful data set. So that is done using what we call the quantize. That if you have a range of data set, you arrange it, you and try to see whether the this data fits into a group. Are the are the readings very closely spaced or they are deviant? The various ways to look at it. You look at the uh, they look at quantile, the first quarter, the three fourth quantile, so on and so forth, which tells you that if you make a series of measurement of the same quantity, how Well coordinated or correlated, these are, and these is usually presented in a box plot which looks like this. So this was a, my data set. It tells me my median was here. This is the range between one fourth of the data set and three fourth of the data set, and these are the widely discrepant points. So whenever you make a repeated measurement, you like this box. To be as squeezed as possible. So people who do statistical analysis will appreciate this. This is what they call the box plot or the whisker plot, where they really try to represent how closely or how identical these data sets are. And this is a simple two-line code. As I said, these codes may look Greek and Latin to you at the moment, but please do not uh, be scared. I'm sure by the end of this workshop, you would be able to run. Most of these codes and tailor it for your own applications. As I said, so this is what you do most of the time when I like to read data, plot data, fit it, and get some value and present the data. Now let me talk to you of some of the applications of Python in our daily UG and PG curriculum. So I'll just skip this. I'll come to this. Now we know that most of the time in mathematics and in quantum mechanics, you are faced with transcendental equations. Those are equations which have to be solved either graphically or analytically. They cannot be expressed as an algebraic object. Now, if you have this equation, sine x is equal to x square by four, it is a transcendental solution. What you would do is you would then plot sine x. You would plot X squared by four. So what I'm doing is I'm plotting sine x and x squared by four, and I see where they intersect. That is the solution of x. So my x would be somewhere around 1.9. This I've been able to get by looking at the plot of sine x, plot of x squared by four, and where they interact. Or What I see is I do sine x minus x square by four, and where the solution interacts, technically we say there is a change of sign before. So if I have a function f x equal to sine x minus x square by four, before the root and after the root, there is a change of sign. So the change of sign helps you determine the solution of a transcendental equation. Or I can plot the two functions where they intersect. That x value gives me the solution. And and if you see, your I plotted sine x x square by four. They intersected here. So around x equal to one point nine is my root of the equation, which again is confirmed by the point that at x equal to one point nine there is a Change of sign. Now this can be done using Python by doing just two simple plots, 
or I calculate sin x minus x square by 4 and I plot it and I see where this has changed the sign. So that is how I get my equation to transcendental equation. I can also solve them analytically using another package called psi p and what I do is I tell it of course all the root finding methods need an initial guess. If you give a wrong guess you may not be able to get them. So that is how I what I did was I did three things. I plotted sin x, x square by 4, see where they interacted. I plotted fx equal to sin x minus this, see where there was a change of sign and I also solved it analytically and I do find all of them gave me a result or the root was around x equal to 1. So this is how you can solve a transcendental equation. Now if you ask me why have I spent so much time on a transcendental equation? So these equations are of paramount importance in quantum mechanics. I'll just, this is a graph most of you have seen in your quantum mechanics book by Griffin. And you have wondered that how this graph has been made. Let me tell you this is nothing but the solution to the transcendental equation for a finite square well potential. If you do all the mathematics for the square well potential, as I told you, I will try to increase the complexity. Here, I assume that I know the solution to the square well potential is represented for even n and odd n. And this is nothing but the transcendental equation that I showed you, sin x and x squared by 4. These are just, just, just the generic name. So if I have, I know the equation, the, the uh, energies for the particle bound in a square well, finite square well, is a solution of these transcendental equations where we do some mathematics to make some dimensionless quantities which is well defined in your, in your Griffith and I just solve these two equations that I have this and I have this and I plot them together. That's what I have exactly done. Tan E, if you see, and on the other side, it was one, uh, I, I calculated the cot E and then I did under square root V by E squared minus one. That's what it stands for. Sorry. This is in terms of energy, this is in terms of depth of well, uh, these are all standard things you can find. In your day. So I've just borrowed the last equation and then I just ran these plots. So this is the energies of a particle having energy trapped in a potential of 15 volts. Wherever they interact, you will have the E even and odd solution. So this is a standard problem. It's actually a problem from Griffith. If you see it, this problem I think has been solved in, in the Griffith. Now you can actually compare the results that Griffith has given after doing all the complex mathematics and your simple program gives you. In your Griffith, you'll find they have told you, now what happens if you increase the depth of the potential? You, you start wondering what happens, what not. All you do is change this value. If the potential is made more deeper, make it 50. You'll see the number of solution decrease. You'll see by, uh, by reducing this, solution increase. And whatever is written in the Griffith book, you'll be able to do it yourself and convince that yes, it is actually what happened simple way, I knew the solution, I knew the functional form, I know the transcendental equation, I just plot, it's as simple as plotting the two functions. And of course, it may give you some error because of divide by zero, but don't bother. Again, your conventional sieve or photon program would have crashed the moment you have a divide by zero. This guy knows you are an idiot and you are not that much of an expert programmer. You may make a mistake, so it forgives you and just gives you an error that you did some divide by zero I forgive you and then you start continuing. So this is the, and this I like very much to present to the students because this is something we see in our books, we buy heart it, but we have never really learned how to do it. So once you have the Python, a friend to talk to you, it makes quantum mechanics, a it was really scary for me. Quantum mechanics, Griff, Shift, uh, uh, Griff, uh, Shift, Griffiths, 
really gives me the scare. But now I think I understand some of these. So this is something which you know of an equation in quantum mechanics. And similarly, your scattering form of potential, you think all these problems can be solved. In fact, we have solved them and shared with uh, Parag. If, I, if he does not have, just let me know. I will send send across all the all, all the material. So that's how you have been able to use this friend to befriend the beast, which they will give you the night. Another thing which always gave me, of course, some of these I have done because of my own personal difficulties I faced when I was a student. We all know quantum mechanics. Yes, we have to talk of Schrodinger equations. And the moment you talk of Schrodinger equations, you have heard there is eigenvalues, eigenvectors. You need to diagonalize the matrix, this, that, and you have lost the entire flavor. Because mathematics at times scares people. Away. Of course, it scares uh, 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 students like us, uh, me at, at least, away. And so I needed a friend which would befriend me with all these things. The moment I talk of Schrodinger equation, I end up with what are called the second order differential equation. Now, there are numerical tricks to solve such equation. So this is a trick we use to solve the first order equation. This is a trick we use to solve the second order differential equation. Now, please note it is y n plus 1 minus 2 y n plus y n plus 1. You will see these full in books. There you will have Mathematica which gives you codes to solve Schrodinger equation for harmonic oscillator, finite potential, and you really do not know what was happening. Let me try to take a few minutes and explain to you what is happening. Please remember this equation n plus 1 n. And uh, I, I think one of them is n minus 1. Uh, this should be, I think, n minus 1, there is a type. Yeah, it's n minus 1. So, if you see this second order equation can be written as y n plus 1 minus 2y plus y n minus 1. So, this was my differential equation. Now, having this differential equation, I'll say I'm going to use five points to solve it. I know my boundary condition says 0 is the wave function has the value 0 at the endpoints. So y0 and y5 is equal to 0. I just have to determine this code. So what I do? I say j equal to 1. I will have psi2 minus 2 psi1 and this would be 0. So for j equal to 1, I have minus 2 psi1 plus psi2. For j equal to 2, this will be 3. This is 2. This will be 1. So I repeat for 1 to 4 and I get this. This matrices you will see in all numerical books which talk about using numerical methods to solve Schrodinger equation. But they do not explain how you have got this. So simple method, you will see that you will have minus 2, 1, 0, 0. And if you look at it, you end up getting what are known as banded matrices. So this is what I do whenever I have a second order differential equation d to y by dx squared. It is simply written as n plus 1 minus 2n plus n minus 1 and you get matrices like this and you will have, I always like to work in natural units where it I take h, m, e all become equal to 1. That makes life e, e easy. So you are left with such matrices. So you have what we call the kinetic energy matrix. You have what we call the potential. You add them together is what you call the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is nothing but the total energy of the system having kinetic and potential energy. Kinetic energy is represented in a, in a banded matrix because of a form like this. So you make the kinetic energy matrix, you make the potential energy matrix, you add them together, you have your total Hamiltonian. <coughs> the moment you have your Hamiltonian, you diagonalize it. And, uh, uh, diagonalization means you write the characteristic equation and then solve them. You get the eigenvalues. You put them into some equational form to get the eigenvectors, which finally gives me the wave function of the particular system. Now, this, as I said, once you set up this equation, this may look a bit 
uh, tough or scary, but just give it some time, go through it. When, uh, after you see that, you will understand how we have got it. And then this is the simple program to do it. I have a potential. I think I, I have taken an X square potential. You can take a harmonic oscillator potential. You can take a square well potential. You change this potential and you have the solution of the wave function and energies to a particle in a harmonic oscillator, particle in a square wave, so on and so forth. You make the kinetic energy matrix. As I said, the kinetic energy matrix has the principal diagonal as minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. And on either side, it has 1. So that's how you are able to make this banded matrices. I think you can try these programs, print it out, see yourself. I made the potential matrix. I make the Hamiltonian. Of course, this is this H is not the Planck's constant, but in this H corresponds to the difference H we have used here. This H is actually. So I had the box, I had the length going from minus six to plus six. I do it for a certain number of points. And what I do is so I build up my Hamiltonian. A simple line, as I told you. You N NumPy has programs to handle most of the things. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Okay, okay. So once I have the kinetic energy, I have the potential, I can construct the total Hamiltonian in a matrix form. This is the most simplest method to do the quantum mechanical problem. I have one line of code to diagonalize this matrix. In fact, to begin with, you can have a simple two by two matrix, run this line of code on it, it will give you the eigenvector, it will give you the eigenvalues, you can check with the various identities that they make sense. So, and then you actually solve a real time equation. And then these are just some bookkeeping you have to do because of the way it prints out the result. So this the most important step is here. Once you have done this step, you have values which will give you eigenvalues, vectors will give you eigenvectors, and then I'm just doing some bookkeeping. And this is some normalization that I do with my zero. And lo and behold, you have the wave function for the harmonic oscillator. This is what you know is for zero. It has one, one node. This is for the first order. This is n equal to one. And you see, we are all. So that is how you can actually visualize the entire process that you have studied. So you can use this to solve your square well potential, harmonic oscillator potential. You put in the form of a potential, you would be able to get the eigenvalues, the energies, and the wave functions. You do a normalization. So this is actually what you see in your textbook is something that you can actually do it yourself and see. Let me talk of one more application of this in statistical physics. All of us have studied heat capacity. And heat capacity, you know, again, it involves the moment you have integrals, you hit a bottom line. To solve most of the integrals, you have to use either some approximations, some low temperature approximations, some high temperature approximation. And, but, but if you have Python, Python has F, uh, libraries packages which actually does this integration for you. So this I thought was the best example to talk about some of the mathematical abilities of Python which actually reflects in your, this is the heat capacity we have all studied, you have the device model, you have the Einstein model, of course in the Einstein model there is a catch here you have to remember N actually stands for 3 because it has the three dimensional harmonic oscillator that we, it has X and Y and Z degree of freedom. So you had these humongous, scary looking equations. They, you see, Python allows you to do these kind of a numerical integration. So integration can be done numerically. You really don't have to solve them explicitly. And then you see, what I did was there was a data available on for CV and temperature. What I did was, as I told you, <coughs> I'm able to do a fit. So I have temperature, 
which was my independent variable, and specific heat, which was when that is, they have measured specific heat at different temperatures. And then I told them, they told my program, look, these are my two x and y. I need to fit it to Einstein model, which is, if you, if you re remember, Einstein model was Cv is equal to nkv. Let us call it x squared, h omega, e to the power x by t. Exactly what I wrote. 3 Na into Kb into x squared, n exponential something, minus 1 divided by this. And you, for d by, you remember this, there, there was an integral. So before I fit this function, what I did was I calculated this integral used numerically. It is possible that you do a numerical integration. So I told the, my program that whatever data you have, you have to fit it to this model and it is able to give you the value of x and y. And you see, this is the data points. If I assume the Debye model, it gives a particular fit. If I assume the Einstein model, it gives a fit. And at low temperatures, it will, it will fit to the T cube plot. That Cv versus T cube would be a straight line. This also, you can check it. So this is some of the applications that you have of Python in your normal everyday teaching. This is what something we talked about because most of the workshops in Python, they only talk about the basics of Python. They really don't show you how you can apply it. So here are some of the examples you can use it to do your absolute everyday numerical calculations which you face in your textbook. Another thing we found was very important and very useful was when I talk in terms of signal processing. You know that given a signal, we physicists like to view it in the time domain. Engineers like to view it in the frequency domain. And you can go from time domain to the frequency domain by using what is known as the Fourier transform. This is what you do is it really was gave, gave me a nightmare as a student when I had to use some series to understand Fourier series and then do the Fourier transformation. But Python or any numerical toolkit allows you to do this transformation from the time domain. As I told you, I had two signals centered around 40 hertz and 120 hertz. And you can see 40 and 120. And the other harmonic was one third of it. So I made a signal. In computation, that's good. You are the god. You can make anything that you want. So you make a signal like this, you saw it in the time domain, yes, it is, looks like this, and then you did a Fourier transform. A Fourier fast Fourier transform when you went from time to frequency in one simple step. These again are something which I do to plot it properly, but if you just plot FFT, you would have seen two peaks. The second peak will have one third the amplitude of the first peak because that I have given it to be one. So you, you had a, you made this signal out of two kind of frequencies, 40 hertz and 120 hertz. And indeed, this signal, when in the time domain, when viewed in the frequency domain, is actually looking to have two peaks around 40 hertz. Another thing which you can see is talk about the various filters. This is a uh, filters that we usually do, RC, CR, a combination of them. I know the relation between the input and output voltage. I, I just do a plot and you can see even various filters. If I have a step response, how do I see the step response? So I can have a CR, RC, all that I do, I have to do is simply change this equation. This is the equation which are with the various forms are for a CR, RC, CR, RC, and a CR. Because this is something which we need in nuclear physics. And therefore, I have tried to do this. So this is how you can use Python to look at various aspects of signal process. I guess I leave it with you at that. And this was one of the pictures I actually was able to have a sighting of. A, a, I think next time when I'm on my way to Azirata, I I I will have a stop at every. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. And then how, uh, yeah, 
the use of Python for dealing with um, uh, physical physics problems. That was very interesting. And yeah, 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 on the onset, it may look a little difficult, but yeah, at the end of this workshop, we hope that the yeah. students will be able to appreciate it. And uh, sir, yeah, uh, we are very much looking forward to future collaboration. And as you have also mentioned, if you are anytime coming to Bohati, please do visit us. And we will be very glad to have you in our department. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I will send this uh, slide across so you guys can 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 put it up. And I think Parag has my uh, talk for my last uh, workshop, and also you can share it with your participants. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Sir, and then particip participants, if you have any questions, while uh, sir is still with us, you can discuss and interact with him. So, participants, if you have any questions, you can off your on your mic and ask, or you can type your queries in the chat box. Yes, we can take a few questions. If you have questions, please feel free to ask one or two questions. Or uh, if there is a problem with your mic, you can also type on the chat in the chat box. I think most of the students will take some time to go through it. But as I said, my child wanted to tell them that this is possible, and I'm sure the workshop will make it possible. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, as you mentioned, yeah, maybe yeah, it will take little time to digest. Yeah, yeah. since we have no questions uh, from the organizing part as well as the participants, let me take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sandeep Gore once more. Thank you very much, sir. And then going ahead with the session thank now. You, sir. May... Pleasure, and we okay. hope we can remain in touch. Thank you. Yes, sir. Surely, sir. Uh, going ahead, uh, let me now uh, invite. Mr. Parag Bhattacharya to take his session on introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. Mr. Parag. Thank you, Amma. And uh, I would like to first of all express my gratitude to Dr. Sandeep Kugre for delivering such an illuminating talk in such a short span of time. It's I know it's difficult to actually cover so many diverse topics within just one hour. So I'm really thankful, sir, and uh, looking forward to more interactions with you in the future and probably, uh, probably more uh, uh, involvements and cooperation between uh, your institution and our department. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, like Sir had mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep, he is going to provide us the slides and he has already given permission to use the material. Uh, in fact, I was actually, I wanted to ask him after the, the workshop whether I can share the material from that other workshop which I had attended in the month of June this year. And since he has already given the permission, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all his files inside uh, that uh, shared Google Drive. Okay, today, today uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to put all the files over there. Uh, you just need to go to that link which is there on your schedule day one okay that link which is there at the bottom for the resources you go there and you'll find all the slides over there okay so and uh, dr sandeep it'll be nice if you can just email your slides from today's lecture so i can share that also all right so uh moving forward uh what i'll be doing now is giving you a demo because you have already had uh, witnessed uh, um, illuminating demonstrations of the use of Python. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, you know uh, this, uh, show you how Jupyter Notebooks how they actually work. So first, it is going to be just a, a gentle introduction to Jupyter Notebooks, just uh, uh, to show you the capabilities of Jupyter Notebook, and then we will go into further details of the same. Okay, so let me just begin by uh, sharing my screen. Alma, just let me know when my screen is visible. Yeah, it's coming now. Yes, it is visible now. OK. So uh, this is how a Jupyter Notebook looks like. Oh, I can hear some noise here. All right. Uh, I would just like to request all the participants that uh, just keep your uh, phone uh, this uh, uh, cameras off and your mics muted. In case you have a query, you can just feel free to uh, you know uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. All right. So coming to the uh, Jupyter notebook, this is how a Jupyter notebook looks like. Okay. More about this later. First, you know the best way to convince somebody is 
to show them of something is to show them how it works, right? So I want to convince you that the Jupyter Notebook is a really good and very easy tool to use. So how do I convince you? I'm going to show you doing, I, I'm going to show some demo here. So before I actually go and try to explain what are these things that we see over here, running clusters and all these, before I explain all of this, let me just go straight in and give you a demo, okay? So there is this demo file which I have created. And when you open this, when I click on this one, when I click on this, it is going to create another tab. And in that tab, this is going to appear. So right now it's empty. As you can see, there's nothing over here, okay? Now I'll, I'll try to demonstrate to you why it is called as a Jupyter Notebook. Why Notebook? Okay. Why, uh, what do we use Notebooks for? We use Notebooks for obviously taking notes, right? So if you have any ideas in your head, you can uh, you know, you, uh, jot down those ideas in a Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook, it allows you to do that only. Okay. It allows you to jot down ideas. Now, suppose as a scientist, let's say, okay, I'm thinking about stuff, right? What's happening around me. So I could have many different ideas coming. Some, some of these ideas could be abstract ideas. Some of these ideas could be, you know, how to implement specific, uh, you know, problem. So in, in, if I were to write a notebook, it would contain, you know, it would con consist of text. It, should, it would consist of uh, programs, okay, program codes, not the entire program, just parts of the program code. And it will also include probably something like diagrams. Okay, so those are the things that could be there inside a notebook. So this is how a Jupyter notebook looks like, and I'll show you how I'm going to do that. Okay, so let's say um, I, I, I wake up in the morning and suddenly, you know, some weird thought comes to my mind. Okay, let's say for some reason, let's say I start thinking about the Titanic, right? All of you remember, know what I'm talking about, no? The Titanic disaster, right? So we all know about the, the terrible tragedy that the Titanic, the Titanic was, right? So I'm thinking about the So you might be uh, wondering as to like, how is this related to the topic that we are, why are we suddenly talking about Titanic? Uh, some few moments back, we were talking about, you know, we are, you are learning about quantum mechanics and how to implement quantum mechanics. Problem. Now suddenly, why are we talking about the, uh, the Titanic disaster? So we all are, because this is something that we all are familiar with. I mean, everybody is uh, aware of what a tragedy it was, right? So I'm going to use a data set, okay? I, there is a famous data set which is available. I'm going to use that over here. So now what I'm going to do is the right now what I'm thinking is I'm thinking about the Titanic disaster. So what happened was I happened to watch the movie, the Titanic movie. And then in the movie, okay, this, this was, this was a nine, I think 1997 movie. Okay. In the 1997 movie, uh, the captain, okay. Of the, of the Titanic. Uh, uh, he said, okay, when the ship was uh, singing, uh, it was beginning to sink. I think it was the captain. I don't really remember who exactly said. He said one famous word, women and the children first. Okay. Those of you who have watched the movie, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. The captain said women and children first. So the question that is there in my mind is, did that really happen? Did that really happen? Did women and children, did they have, did they, if suppose the question that I would like to put scientifically if I'd like to put is, okay, the same question, the very same question, if I were to put this scientifically, I would say something like this. If you were a woman or a child on board the Titanic, did you have a greater chance of survival so this was the scientifically this is what i would like to find out okay if you are a woman or a child on board the titanic did you have a greater chance of survival so we are i'm now casting the same thing okay these first two lines whatever i have said here i uh, remembered a movie in a movie there was a dialogue and from the basis of the dialogue i got a question in my mind the same question now i'm recasting it in a scientific way okay i'm trying to look at it in the in the terms of probabilities the chance of survival whether what's the probability that a woman or a child on board the titanic had a chance of survival did they have really have a greater chance of survival than men or was it the was it just something uh, that was uh, just uh, said in the movie just for the sake of cinematic effect so that's what i am wondering okay so how, what do i do there, there happens to be a very famous uh, data set, the Titanic uh, data set. Okay, so it's, let me just show you here. It's probably, 
Yeah, this is called the Titanic.csv. It's available online. It's a very famous data set. It's a Titanic.csv. It's a CSV file. CSV stands for Comma Separated Values file. So uh, CSV file can be op opened using Excel or uh, I'm using Linux here. So you can open this using LibreOffice Calc also. So let's just open this uh, file and see what's there inside this file. Okay. I hope you're able to see the file. So this is basically just a normal, like just like an Excel file. Okay. So we have uh, so many columns and we have so many rows, different rows. We have uh, lots of rows and lots of different columns. So it contains first the passenger ID, survive, zero means the person has not survived. One means the person has survived. Then the passenger class, name, sex, age. Okay. And I'm not sure about this. The ticket, fare, came in and embarked. Okay. So all these details are here. It's in the, it's basically a uh, database. Okay. So uh, you can also open this using, uh, you know, text editor also. If I open this using a text editor, you'll see this is how the file looks like. It is, that's why it's called as comma separated values because the values are separated by commas. You can see here passenger ID and then there is a comma and then survive and comma. So basically when you open this using Excel, no, what happens is Excel understands it as that whenever there is a comma, that is one data, right? One uh, between two commas, between two commas, that is one piece of data. So this is one comma and this is another comma. So whatever comes in between is basically one piece of data. So this is what we have. Okay. So this is how it looks like. You just open it using a text editor. So this data is actually available online. It's a very famous data set. So it's actually available online. So I thought that, okay, maybe let's, you know, download that data. So I downloaded that data and I placed it in the folder wherever I have opened this, my notebook. You can see it here. You can see this, the titanic.csv, this file. Okay. It's opened over here. So now let's try to read from this file. Okay. So let's try to read from this file. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a certain uh, Python package. Okay. It's called pandas. Okay, I import pandas as pd. Okay, uh, I'll in, I'll uh, you know explain to you what this really means, what all these words, what they really mean. I'll explain to you. That's what the whole purpose of the workshop is. So right now, let me just give you a demo. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, you know uh, I'm going to create something called as a data frame. Okay, I'm going to create something called as a data frame. I'll call this data frame as Titanic, which will contain all the data. Okay, and then I'm going to read from this file read and I press tab, it will show me that uh, what are the options that I have. Okay, many different options are here. I can read from many different sources. I can read a CSV file. I can read from an Excel file also. It could be an Excel file also. So because it's a CSV file, comma separated values file, I'll select this. So read CSV and inside this, I need to give the name of the file. The name of the file is titanic.csv. Titanic.csv. Okay, now Run this, it's running fine, no errors. Okay, so now let me see what kind of data it is, okay? So I, I don't want to see because you would have probably, if you remember when I opened this using a spreadsheet, there were like more than uh, very close to 900 rows. Okay, so I don't want to open the entire uh, database. I just want to see if there, uh, you know, the data is consistent or not. So I just, you know, call this function call as Titanic head. Okay, and then this is going to show me. Okay, so it's just a sample. It just gives me the first, you know, first five lines, first five rows. It will just show me, just to give a, give me a sample of okay, whether the data is fine or not. So okay, this is what I'm looking for: passenger ID, whether he survived or not, passenger class, name, sex, age, and so on. Okay, so these are the things that is available over here. Okay, now I want to know, uh, you know, how many people have survived. Okay, I want to know how many people have survived. Okay, so for that, how do I do that okay so i can do that this way titanic dot i want to find out how many people have survived so you see if you use uh, excel what will you do those of you who use excel suppose this was an excel sheet what will you do you will create a filter and in that filter under survive you select i want to find who has survived so you, under filter there are only two values either zero or one you'll choose one so i can do the same thing over here also so i could just you know from titanic i could just call this particular uh, column survived okay and then i find out the value kind counts value counts okay and let me run this okay this is what it says it says zero 
zero values okay i mean 549 rows are there there are 549 rows which have the value zero and there are 340 rows which have 42 rows which have the value one so this itself tells you i mean it's just numbers right but it just tells you the scale of the tragedy that the titanic was right there are more zero there are 549 zeros there are 549 zeros that means the 549 people have died in the tragedy and 340 only 342 people have a uh, survived that tragedy so you can actually find out what is the probability of survival that is the probability of survival is simply 342 divided by 349 plus by 34 plus 342 the total count right into 100 that is going to give you the probability as a percentage so you could do that the probability of survival the probability of survival is 342 i can just calculate that 342 342 divided by 549 plus 342 549 0 i have to put a zero here because otherwise it will interpret this as an integer and 342 if it in interprets this as an integer it is going to give me simply a value zero so it gives me this so what is the probability of survival it is around um, uh, 34% 34% probability that a person on the titanic has survived okay so uh, but then these are just numbers let's try to find out let's see if we can you know uh, show this uh, graphically if we can you know because we like visualization so let's see if we can you know uh, show the same thing the same information if we can show it graphically we can do that the same thing value counts but this time i want to plot okay i want to plot over here what kind of plot we like pie charts right pie class in such cases pie charts they give us a very you know beautiful and very fun way of representing data so So what I'm going to do is the kind of plot that I want. The kind of plot that I want is a pie chart. Okay, so it gives a pie chart here. You can see here, blue means uh, zero and uh, orange means white. So you see where we have a more area under blue, less area under orange. So it means more people. These are the people who have died in that tragedy, and these are the people who have survived. Okay, so this gives me a basic idea of you know uh, what kind of uh, like what was the chance of survival. Okay, now coming back to the question that I have had. The question was, if you are a woman or a child on board the Titanic, did you have a greater chance of survival? Okay, let's try to figure that out. Okay, so first let's look at women. Okay, so what I'm going to do is you can see here there is a column called that. So how do I you know segregate? How do I you know filter out all the women? There is a column called the sex. so i could use this column and in that column i could set the value as female and there is going to select all the uh, women from this particular uh, database so i'm going to do that i'm going to create a new data frame a separate data frame okay i i'll call it as women and here i'm going to just select this will be a subset of the titanic data frame and what i'm going to do is i'm going to give a condition titanic and uh, which column are we looking for we are looking for the column sex so over here i'll just put this column name okay and then we are looking for what kind of values are we looking for we are looking for it to have the value female okay so we are, we are looking for so that basically what is going to do is it is going to uh, is going to from this original database from this original database it will select all those rows in which the sex column it is carrying the value female okay so that's what it will do so we run this it has run perfectly so we have created this database okay so now let's find out out of this women how many women have survived okay and how many women have survived so we do it in the same way we do it in the same way but this time let me just directly get into to the pie chart so let's say i just copy this code and paste it here and instead of looking at the titanic i'm looking for the women data frame the women survived value counts and the plot that we are making is a pie chart okay so now here blue represents one that means survived and the uh, orange represents yellow that means did not survive so you can see here more women have survived even though even though in the titanic more people have died than people who have uh, um, survived but when you look at women more women have actually survived than you know the, the women who have died so it means this part of this if you are a woman or a child on board the titanic okay if you are a woman yes there is definitely a, a good a greater chance that 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 woman has survived okay now let's talk about the kids okay and the children okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create another data frame kids okay so now this data frame also similar to this similar to this okay we are going to create the same data frame similar to this 
but the condition i'm going to change now because uh, you know obviously i cannot uh, sort out on uh, on sex for children right i can't do that because children could be male or female so now i can do the sorting in terms of age i could do the sorting in terms of age so let us just keep 14 years as the definition of children okay so i will just re replace this column with age the sex column i'll replace with age okay and then the condition that i'm going to make here is it the age is less than equals 14 if your if your age is less than 14 you are considered to be a child and you will come in this data frame called as kids okay we compile we run this now we want to find out how many kids have survived okay so kids dot survived value count value counts and then again i want to pie chart here you could put a put a bar chart also Or let me use a bar chart here. You can see here, this is a bar chart. This is uh, one and this is zero. More children have survived compared to children who have died in the tragedy. Okay, so that means it shows, you know, yes, if you're a woman or a child on board the Titanic, you did have a greater chance of survival. Now let's look at the men because the number of people dead is still very large. No, let's look at men. How did the men, uh, you know, fare in this one? So that is easy. All I need to do is I need to just use this and create another data frame called as men. So here I'll call this data frame as men. And instead of you know filtering on female, I'll filter on male. Okay. Now let's see how many men have survived. It has to be the other way around because otherwise, you know, the results will not be consistent. Men, as expected, you know, these are the men who have survived and these are the men who have passed. So you know that the majority of the people, the majority of the people who did not survive the tragedy, most of them were actually men. Okay, so this is very quickly I have been able to you know, uh, figure out, okay, uh, this, uh, you know, if, if you're a woman or a child on board the training, did you have a greater chance of survival? The answer, of, of course, in, the, in this case, the answer is, yes, I go back here, the answer is yes. All right, so now, immediately after, you know, doing this, now another question comes to my mind, another question comes to my mind. The question is, okay, uh, we have found out that women and children have survived, but then there is also one more column here. There's also one more column here. That column is... P, P class means passenger class. P class means passenger class. Okay. First class, second class, third class. Okay. P class. So let's first find out how many classes are there. Okay. Let's find out how many classes are there. How we can do that? We can do that just by using this value counts. So Titanic dot P class dot value counts. Titanic dot P class dot value counts. Oops. Sorry. This has to be code. Okay. Titanic p class dot value counts let's run this okay there are only three kinds of values okay first class second class and third class okay so these are three kinds of values so maybe the question that comes to my mind right now okay when i find this then there are three classes the question that comes to my mind right now is did This is the question that comes to my mind now. Did financial background have a role to play in one survival? Okay, no doubt we are seeing that women have a lot of women have survived. We have seen that a lot of women have sur survived, more women have survived, and more children have survived. But then the question is, yeah, yeah, more children have survived and more women have survived. No doubt we have seen that. But then, uh, what about the, the your uh, financial background? If you're rich, did that have any contribution to it? If you're rich. Uh, if you're if you're uh, uh, rich, very if you're more well off, did you have a higher chance? If you're a rich woman, if you're the question that I have in mind is, if you're a rich woman or if you're a child from a rich family, did you have a, did did that uh, child or did that woman did they have a higher chance of survival on the Titanic? Okay, that's what I want to know. So you can look at the uh, the passenger class. You can see here just by looking at this, the passenger class and the fare. The passenger class one, the fare is 17, uh, 71, I think, 
yeah, I think this is in dollars. Okay, so that time it was in dollars. So seventy-one dollars, and for third yeah, third class it was uh, seven point two five dollars. Right. So you can see wherever there is a passenger class one, the fare is more. Okay, that means you have they have paid more fares for the, they have paid more for their tickets. So which means those are the people who could afford it. So people who are in passenger class one, they are the ones who are more financially well off. Okay, so now the next thing that I want to know is from this women, from this data frame of women, how many rich women are there? How many women from the passenger class one have survived? How many women from passenger class two have survived? And how many women from the passenger class three have survived? So this is what I want to know. So I'll just take this code because I'm going to use this. Okay, so let's see. Let's look at it for women. I want to know how many women from passenger class one. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter on this for women. I'm going to filter on this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this P class. Okay, I'm going to use this P class. Wherever P class is equal to one passenger class one women for whom the passenger class is one. How many of them have survived? Let's look at the pie chart now. You can see here, right? One means blue. These are the women from the first class who have survived. A very tiny fraction of women from the first class have actually did not survive. Let's look at what happens for women in the second class. Second class again, chance of survival is better. Let's look at the third class. Almost 50 50. So, if you're a woman, even though just being a woman is not enough to, to survive on the Titanic, if you're a woman from either from the first class or the second class, then there's a better chance that you have survived. Now, the same thing we can apply this for children as well. And we're able to get some you know meaningful information, meaningful insights from this. So, you see what I have done here. I did not actually open any you know, uh, ID for any programming language. All I, that I did was I started from here. I started with the thought that I watched this movie and a thought which came to my mind and I downloaded the data and I used that data okay, to obtain these plots and these plots gave me uh, some insight. Okay, So just women and children is not enough. Just saying women and children not enough. Okay, what women and children from the upper classes? They are the ones who are the who have the who had the better chance of survival. Now I leave it to you. Okay, the rest of this I'll not do. I could go on doing this. I could find out for the same for children. I could find out the same for the men also. Even though you you know some more insightful thing is suppose I look at the men. Okay, you see that a lot of men have died. A lot of men have died. But if I look, if I just you know uh, break this down into category the, the classes, class one, class two, and class three, most probably my hypothesis is men from the class one they had a much higher chance of survival than men from class two or class three so you see the social divide that was there that we see that we take for granted in this uh, in our present day world it was always Prag. yeah i mean this is so interesting would you please do it for men of high class we okay just want okay to okay great let me just go and create this okay so i already, it's already there so I, the data frame for men is already there. So you want the men from the upper class, right? Yes. OK, let me just, I'll just copy this. I'll just uh, change this from women. I'll make it men. OK, so this is from class one. Class one. OK, now, of course, it looks like many men have died. But we have to take this. We have to compare this not with the women. OK, this one, class one. For you don't have you can't compare this with the women. We have to compare this with class one for men, class two and class three for men. Okay, so let's do that. Second class. You see the survive the survivors are smaller now. Third class. I'm sure the survivors will be even smaller. Okay, I mean, uh, they look more or less the same, but I think this is marginally smaller. So there is a huge disparity, second class, in case of men, between second class and third class and the first class, there is a huge disparity. So, I mean, that social distinction, the distinction on the basis of, you know, you have money, money is power, that's what they say, right? 
that's a saying that we hear right money is power we're actually seeing that we are actually seeing that from a tragedy so this is one thing that we have learned from this particular tragedy so that's the titanic so this is uh, all this i have done using a jupiter notebook what i have done here is a jupiter notebook okay samrat uh, i hope you're satisfied <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> now, now the question is: the question is, in which class do we belong? <laughs> in which class? Okay, that question I don't think we will answer that using a Python code. <laughs> I'm basically interested in uh, you know finding uh, solutions to our uh, everyday problems. Okay, okay. Now I'd like to show you one more demo, okay, just to you know uh, make my case, to make my case stronger that we should actually you know start using you know. Uh, now you see whatever I have done here, no, whatever I have done here, you can do the same thing using an Excel file also. Okay, the same thing you can do it using Excel file. So it's just you know filter out and you select the data and then you create charts. But if you do any of you who has worked on Excel, you will know that it's you know such a painful process to actually work in Excel. It's such a painful or any spreadsheet software. It's a really a painful process. But in using when you use a Jupyter notebook and you use a Python, okay, especially this package called as Pandas. If time permits, I'll show you how to use Pandas maybe towards the end of the workshop if time permits. Just by using a few lines of code, and also I did not have to, you know, do it for everything. I just wrote maybe a couple of lines, and I just copied and pasted those lines, and just changed, played around here and there. Okay, so that's the power of you know Jupyter Notebook, and uh, you know using Python on Jupyter Notebook. Now I'd like to show you one more demo, one more physical demo. Now this is, of course, this is something that you know it's uh, we know about this tragedy, but then how does it affect us? Does it are we able to relate to that? Can we relate to this tragedy? Of course, I mean we can't because it happened. We are separated from this tragedy both in space and time. It happened many years ago. It happened many miles uh, away from us, right? So it's not really for us. I mean we just know about this from the movie, and then of course we have some general knowledge about this, but that's about it. We, I mean. Apart from that, I'm not able to relate much to this particular problem. So let me show you a problem from my own personal experience. Okay, from my own experience. In fact, as recent as yesterday. Okay, the problem was this. Okay, uh, I, I was supposed to take a lab exam. I was supposed to take a lab exam for uh, BSc students, BSc uh, third semester students uh, from the chemistry and the mathematics department. And you know what? I mean, in the lab, how do we do? Uh, I'm, I'm basically I'm trying to simulate the real life scenario. Okay. So in uh, the lab, generally how we uh, have our uh, you know uh, uh, this uh, lab exams is we have you know certain uh, number of experiments. We decide okay, okay that uh, uh, experiment number one four students will do, experiment number two three students will do, and so on. We'll decide like that, and then we randomly assign. We just put up uh, print them on the answer scripts and we f f place them upside down, and then we ask the students to randomly pick up. Okay, any one of those sheets, and whichever they got, that, that's the experiment that they will be doing. So I want to do. I wanted to simulate that, uh, you know, real experience, that uh, ex the real experience of, you know, uh, uh, randomly assigning uh, uh, multiple instances of a fixed number of experiments among those uh, certain number of students. I wanted to actually do that. So how I did that is I used the Python coding actually to do that. So again, I imported the packages that I required. Then there are three data sets. Okay, one is the students, another one is experiments, and third one is experiment instances. So what I did was I, uh, you know, read I uh, read the data inside this using this pd dot read csv. Okay, so now I'll show you uh, the students. Okay, so students, I just use students dot head. I just want to show the first five lines. Okay, so you can see here this is this is the data that is contained in the students.csv. So these are students from chemistry and maths department. So they, they in the students.csv there is serial number, student ID, name, and the branch. Okay. Next experiment instances. Okay. So these are the experiments. These are the experiments that I wanted to do. So there are a total of uh, 11 students. Okay, there are a total of 11 students. So the problem that I was facing is the experiments, number of experiments were five. So I had five experiments. And those five experiments had to be distributed among 11 students. These are the 11 students. Okay, so we have 11 students. And among these 11 students, I have to distribute five experiments. So what I did was I decided that the first experiment will be assigned to three, student, three students, second experiment to two, 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 and two. So total five plus one it gives us 11. Okay, so that's how I had decided. So this is the these are the experiment instances that I had chosen okay so now for that what i did was i created some lists and then i created a uh, set of keys which i shuffled there is a 
packet called as random. It can randomize certain number of keys. It shuffled them. And then I created a new data frame, okay, where in which just like you have, you know, serial number, you have serial number here, student ID, name, branch. So I wanted to I wanted to join these two data frames and create a new data frame. So I created a data frame where the first column was student number, the serial number, student ID, name, branch, experiment number, and experiment name. And then I use a little bit of this uh, you know Python code coding over here. And then what I did, then I was able to create this uh, you know data frame called assign. And now I'll show you how this look like. This is how it look like. So you can see here it has correctly taken. Okay, let's say verification of Boyle's law. There should be three instances, verification of Boyle's law, one, two, and three. Other experiments, heat conduction, two instances, thermal expansion, two exp instances, adiabatic index, two instances, and uh, internal energy, two instances. So it has been able, it has uh, shuffled the experiments and it has provided to the, stu uh, the assigned students also. Now in the last line, what I did was, okay, now I want to show this as a, you know, I want to express this. I, I, I want to uh, put this in the form of a Excel sheet because that's what I want to share because the students, they don't know Python. So I want to share it as an Excel sheet. So I can do that. Okay, just observe the directory here. Moment I run this, a new file will be created. I'll show you. Okay, so here, moment I run this, a new file will be created. You can see here, a new file has got created. Okay, GTP lab test experiments. If I open this, the same uh, information that was there on the notebook it has passed on the same information over here and this is what i shared with my students okay so that's basically how powerful you know um, python is okay so, so these are the two couple of demos that i wanted to actually show you uh, are there any questions if you have any questions i could take them right now or maybe i could if there are no questions then i could move forward uh, no perhaps yes sir uh... yeah Jupyter notebook we have to download or how, how to get it? Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to show now. Okay, so let me close this. Okay, so now coming to Jupyter Notebook, what exactly is a Jupyter Notebook? This is how a raw Jupyter Notebook looks like, okay? You have to, of course, download it, yes, to answer our most questions. You have to download the Jupyter Notebook. There is a software called this Anaconda. That's the easiest way to get Jupyter. I will show you how to get uh, your, uh, this Anaconda, you know, uh, for both as well as for Linux, okay? Uh, so, uh, this one's, I think somebody is trying to enter this, okay? So this is how a Jupyter notebook looks like. Okay, so you can see here I have you know that these are known as what are cells. I'll come to that. So there is introduction to Jupyter notebook. I have written it in this way. It has color coded it. I have put a hash here and I have written introduction to Jupyter notebook. Okay, so now I can run this. How do I run this? You see, it is it is similar to uh, this is known as Markdown. Okay, by the way, it shows that this is known as Markdown. You can see here. It's known as Markdown. Markdown is like you know your HTML. If you those have done HTML coding, you write some bit of code and it understands this. Uh, I'm sure all of us have used Markdown. At least in WhatsApp, you would have used a Markdown. Uh, like for example, let's say I'm typing typing a message on WhatsApp. Okay, let's say I'm typing a message on WhatsApp. Okay, this let's say this is a. Now let's say I want to uh, make uh, certain text bold or italics. What do I do in WhatsApp? You put an underscore and then you put another underscore, right? So whatever comes in between the underscores, that is that becomes italics. Now if I want it to be bold, then what I do is instead of underscore, I put stars. That is going to make it bold, right? So these kind of you know uh, these kind of formats, this kind of formatting, where you put uh, certain characters and those characters have a special meaning. The markdown is basically that. So in WhatsApp, actually, we use a kind of a markdown when we want to make something bold or italics. So what does this hash? What does this hash stand for? It stands for heading. 
so this is my main heading for this notebook this is my main heading okay this is the idea idea is i want to introduce jupiter notebook so this is my main heading so now right now it's looking like this it's not looking the way uh, it's not looking nice so what i can do is i could actually run this when i run this cell then it will look nice so i have to click on run and you can see here now it's coming nice the hash is gone the size of the text has become bigger now it becomes obvious that this is a heading okay so now the same thing i have done here so i have used two hashes here what is the two hashes this is a subheading single hash means heading okay double hashes means subheading and then we put dashes here let's see what these uh, dashes what they mean let me just copy this part give me a second let me just copy this part and i'll show you okay now coming back to this cell okay you could either click on run or you could press control and enter okay when you press control and enter you see this is how it looks like now this is beginning to look like a document which maybe you have typed in your word no this is what it looks like you have nice this bullet points and then we have sub bullet points and so on so jupiter notebook it allows you to do that that's the power of jupiter notebook it is an incredibly powerful tool for interacting the interactively developing and presenting data science because you see when we say data science we are not just looking at the code or the results just like how i had shown you that titanic uh, analysis of titanic so i did not just present to you the code i also presented to you ideas i wrote down right and this is the question that i have i have in my mind so this is the idea that i have in my mind i presented ideas also right so you not only you present code you also present ideas you also present your uh, graphs okay so that is what is meant by developing and presenting data science okay so it basically integrates code the the code and the output of a code all in one single document okay it combines visualization narrative text mathematical equations and all other rich media as we will see through the course of this workshop in fact in this workshop the entire workshop i will be conducting using jupiter notebook only okay all my code i am not going to do any other software only jupiter notebook okay so all my visualization all the text all the mathematical equations all the everything all the other media that i am using the images and so on all of these will be there in the same notebook okay so in a nutshell if somebody asks you what is a jupiter notebook it is basically a single document just like your word document jupiter notebook is also a single document only difference is in jupiter notebook you can run actually run code in microsoft word let's say you are writing a document you cannot run code inside that right suppose you are taking a class for you know like as let's say c python class for students and you are writing a document right and you want to convert that into a pdf you can't actually uh, run put the code inside and then actually run the code also you have to run the code somewhere else get the output and paste the output inside your document but jupiter notebook it allows you to do everything you can write your document you can run the code you can display the output you can add explanations formulas charts everything so in other words jupiter notebook it makes your work more transparent understandable repeatable and shareable okay so you can share your jupiter notebook with anybody in the world and if they run they are going to get exactly the same results that you got and the best part is of course it is completely free okay so that's uh, jupiter notebook so you okay so i'm going to answer your question that's basically jupiter notebook now we will go more into the fundamentals of uh, jupiter trying to understand a little bit more of we'll dissect jupiter notebook more okay so here you have if you remember we used we used a single hash here we use a double hash okay single hash when we used it gave us a heading when we use a double hash it gave us a subheading when we use a triple hash it will do exactly what's on your mind it's going to create a sub subheading that means genesis of jupiter notebook that is going to become smaller than the text will appear to be smaller than this particular text that we have written here okay so the jupiter notebook it actually contains a lot of kernels lot of kernels of um, that is kernel is i mean if that's a computer science term for a programming language that's basically the root okay that's what controls the behavior of the programming language that behavior controls the behavior of the compiler of the programming language that is the meaning of a kernel so there are three high level programming languages those high level programming languages are julia python and r r is another programming language and these are all high level programming languages which are dedicated to data science 
So Jupyter Notebook, it is basically, it contains these three. It started with containing the kernels of these three. Now they have added more kernels of other programming languages also, including SQL and so on. So it basically contains kernels of these three high level programming languages. And in fact, the name Jupyter Notebook is actually derived from Julia, Python and R. Julia, J-U from Julia, P-Y-T from Python. And R, you can't, you can't simply put an R here, you need a vowel. So that's why they put a vowel. E here, okay. So that's the uh, that's basically uh, the three kernels which it started with, and that's why it's known as a Jupyter notebook. Okay. Now you see this image. How did this image magically appear? How did this image magically appear? It did not appear anywhere because I included that image. That image is somewhere over here. That image is here. Day one. That image is here. I could search for this here. The name of the image is jngenesis.png jngenesis.png this is the image jngenesis.png that's the image so what i have done here is i have used the html code you can use html code also this is basically an html code in a html file let's say you want to include an image on your website this is basically the html code that you'll be using you give the name of the source you use something called as a tags you use an img tag okay source the name of the file is this then suppose by for some reason let's say this file is missing then it will show you some alternate text okay if the file is missing it will tell you that this is an alternate text and what will be the width of this okay 400 pixels that's the width and the moment i run this if i run this or if i press control enter okay then this image it will just read the image and it will place the image over here so that's how you are able to see this particular image okay uh, and of course, one more uh, fun fact from here is uh, Jupyter Notebook is a strong reference to Galileo Galilei, which who, who we all know uh, had was is credited with the discovery of the moons of Jupiter. He had uh, developed his telescope, and using this telescope, he had uh, observe. He was the first person to observe the moons of Jupiter, and in his notebooks, okay, Galileo used to maintain elaborate notebooks. In his notebooks, he he used to have all these diagrams of the moons that he had observed and all the astronomical data that he was that he had compiled all of these were there in his notebook so in his notebook he, you could if you look if you go online and if you look for galileo's notebooks if you look at the images you'll find lots of text okay you'll find uh, lots of you know um, numbers okay he had jotted down a lot of observations and lots of figures all in the same notebook okay so this jupyter notebook it is is inspired by the notebooks um, that were developed by galileo galilei and actually you can actually see that in the logo of jupyter itself okay you see this orange circle looks like this is your the planet jupyter and these gray dots that you see those are the moons of jupyter so this is a strong reference to galileo galilei and a tribute to him okay so jupyter notebook j u p y t e r from the three kernels and the way this name has been given is a um, salutation to and Galileo Galilei. Okay, so that basically is your Jupyter notebook. Okay, what Jupyter notebook is basically it's this. Next, how do I get it? So let's say um, based on the demo that I have given and based on what I have you know shown just now, let's say now you're really interested in getting Jupyter. So uh, most of you probably you I'll be uh, I won't be incorrect in assuming that most of you you use Windows. So first I'll show you how to get Jupyter on Windows. Okay, so first how to install Jupyter. Uh, you have to install a software called as Anaconda. Okay, you have to install a software called as Anaconda. You can go to this website, anaconda.com, okay, or anaconda.org. Uh, I will ask my um, colleague Narika to just give a demo of where to go. So uh, let me just uh, stop my presentation and uh, Narika, Narika, are you there? Please, uh, can you present your screen? Yes, sir. Sure. Sir, can you just allow me to present yeah, the screen? Yeah, I'm doing that. Okay, Narika, I think you, you should be able to present now. Uh, sir, uh, did you see my screen? Are you... uh, just a second, let's wait for a while. Can you share again? Can you just uh, you know stop sharing and share again?
Narika, is there a problem? Parang, I think uh, present now option is not available in her. It's okay. not yet showing up in her. Okay, okay, wait a second. Ah, now it has come. Okay, now just try, Narika. You must grant. You, you must uh, grant permission in order Parang, to. But it is written, you must grant permission in order to share. But I have allowed uh, her to share, actually. Let me try again. Yeah. Just a window you can share. Okay. Samrat, can you just try sharing your screen? Let's see if you can share. Yeah, I'll try. Yes, in my own it is possible. Okay, so I think you can only do that. Uh, so I'm, I'll share the link in. Uh, just give me a second. I'll share the link in the chat. Just a second. Okay, Samrat, I have uh, yeah given. Yeah, a I link. Got it. yeah, just open that link. You have to go to www.anaconda.com. Okay. Is my screen visible? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. Uh, once you are in anaconda.com, uh, you can see lots of tabs on top. You go to products. And under yeah. products, you go to individual edition. Under products, you go to individual edition. Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, just scroll down. Just scroll down right till the bottom. Just scroll down. Install an account. Uh, yeah, it's at the bottom. Just go down. You have to select your uh, operating system also. Go down. Oh. Yeah. Under Windows, there will be 32-bit and 64-bit. Download the 64-bit installer. Okay, and just install. Just, it's an exe file. Just install it, and that's it. Okay, that's uh, that is going to uh, install Anaconda, and then you can start using Jupyter Notebook. That's all you need to do for Windows. Okay, uh, Samrat, I think you can uh, you can uh, stop sharing your screen. So okay. I'll go back to. Yeah, I have stopped sharing. Okay, so let me just present mine now. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you're able to see my screen. Yes. yes. Okay, so for Windows, you just have to go here, or you can directly click on this link. Okay, and this link is there uh, in the in this uh, Jupyter notebook. I'll provide that link. Okay, and then you can just start using. You know, uh, once you have installed it, okay, you can just start using. All you have to do is in Windows, uh, you have to go to you have to click on Start. You have to click on the Start button, and then just start typing Anaconda Navigator. Okay, once you click on the Anaconda Navigator, it will open. Uh, the, you'll be able to see the Anaconda Navigator icon. Okay, so you just have to. Uh, Alma, can you keep on um, uh, so admitting the participants? I mean, many are trying to enter. So you keep you just start typing Anaconda Navigator and then click on the Anaconda Navigator uh, icon. This is going to open the Anaconda Navigator GUI. Okay, then after that, in that uh, GUI, you just click on under. Uh, so uh, Jupyter Notebook, you just click on launch. So I'll just show you how that uh, navigator looks like. This is how it is going to look like. Okay, when you open Anaconda Navigator, this is what it's going to look like. So these are all the kernels which are available. Okay, all the available kernels are over here. And uh, you all you have to do is under Jupyter Notebook, you just click on launch. That's all. Okay, once you click on launch, then it will open up Jupyter Notebook on your default browser. 
if you're using Firefox, Mozilla Firefox, it will open uh, Jupyter Notebook, the, this one. It will open something like this, okay? It will open something like this. This is the dashboard. It will open it up on your uh, web browser. If you're using Google Chrome, it will open in Google Chrome, okay? And then you can, you know, uh, go to the folder where the notebooks are. So right now, I'm in this folder day one because this is the day one so i'm going to uh, go to this folder and then you can start using your um, jupyter notebooks as easy as that okay now one note is if you use the anaconda navigator it might slow down your system if especially if your uh, ram is less than 4 gb so if you have more than 4 gb then i don't think it should be a problem okay so this is uh, how you can you know start jupyter notebook okay using anaconda or you can actually, uh, you know, uh, this uh, start Jupyter Notebook directly also. This is using through Anaconda Navigator. Or you can just directly you can open Jupyter Notebook also. In Windows, all you need to do is just go to Start and just uh, click on Start and just start typing Jupyter Notebook. Then the Jupyter Notebook icon will come up. Click on that icon. It will again go take you on the browser. It is going to open something like this. Okay. So that's about getting Jupyter Notebook on, uh, to start on Windows. Okay. Now on Linux, you can install this, okay? So you again, you go to anaconda.com products and uh, individual, and then at the bottom you have you saw three options. One was Windows, another one is uh, Mac OS, another one was Linux. So you go under Linux, you select whichever bit, 64 bit, you download. It's like 549 MB for Linux, okay? And uh, let me go here, yeah. Then uh, this, uh, or, or you, what you can do is you can just you know copy this uh, URL and paste it on your browser. That will also download the same thing. Then what you can do is uh, on the terminal, you just have to open a terminal. On the terminal, you have to type this command. Wherever the, wherever the file has been downloaded, okay, wherever the file has been downloaded, you have to type this command, bash anaconda and the name of the bash, the name of the file, okay? So you have to type the name, this particular command you have to type, and then it is going to do the installation on its own, okay? Then uh, one thing uh, that uh, might bother some people, it actually bothered me for a long time. There is uh, once Anaconda got installed, uh, the Anaconda environment, it modified my uh, prompt, the command prompt that we have you know, in, uh, in a terminal. When you open a terminal, you have a prompt that looks like this. Okay. You, I have actually taken a lot of care to personalize my prompt. Okay. So what happened was in front of the prompt, it just added uh, something called as base. It put something like as base. Okay. So I didn't want that. So there is a, uh, if those who are getting this problem, you can actually fix this. I found a solution to this and uh, the solution again, I'm putting this over here. So those are using Linux. If you see that the terminal prompt has changed, you can actually use these bit of code to actually solve that problem. Okay. And uh, finally, you install the Anaconda Navigator this way. Okay, this is how you can get uh, Anaconda installed on your system if it's a Linux system. Okay, so now how to start using the Anaconda Navigator? You open a terminal. Okay, and then put the write down the command Anaconda Navigator. Okay, and then it is going to open the Anaconda Navigator GUI, and then the same way. Okay, under Jupyter Notebook, you just click on Launch. And it's going to launch this but then again same problem holds good here also uh, it's slow it could slow down the system even on linux systems also so i'm i do it this way okay i i start the terminal uh, from the terminal all i need to do is just go to a terminal and go to the folder which contains the jupyter notebooks and run the command jupyter notebook so let me just show you how i did that first let me save this file Okay, so I'm going to open this Jupyter Notebook from scratch. So what I do is you open a terminal, okay? If you're a Linux user, open a terminal. Then go to the folder which contains all your notebooks, okay? For me, it happens to be on the desktop, okay? So once inside this folder, I want to go to this, this one WCP 2020. So go inside that particular specific folder. So this is where this is all where all my notebooks are, all my data is. So now all you need to do is just type Jupyter space notebook and okay. 
this is going to start Jupyter Notebook and it is going to open it on your web browser. Okay, so this is how the this is how it looks like. So it has opened this. Okay. Now let me go to the folder, the folder which I'm interested in. I'm interested in day one, and right now I'm doing this day one session one. Open this. You can see on the browser on top, you see is localhost uh, colon 8888. That means you're using that you're getting the content from your local system. You're not getting it from some web, some website online you're getting it from your own system okay so this is the folder that where i was okay so this is how you start jupiter from the terminal okay so now coming again okay so now we'll get to know the jupiter notebook a little bit more okay so all right so first, first and foremost, the dashboard. This is the dashboard. So when you open Jupyter Notebook, this, what I see here, this is known as a dashboard. Okay, so this is what the dashboard looks like. You can see the dashboard. It shows you all the files, all the running clusters and so on. So I could go back here and show you files, all the files which are accessible to me right now. If I go to running, it will show you all the notebooks which are right now running. I could shut them down from here. Okay, then uh, if you are doing batch processing, you can do it from here. Parallel processing, if you want to do, you can do it from here. Okay, so that's basically the uh, dashboard. Then inside the dashboard, you have some more commands. You can upload a file. Suppose there are some files that you want to upload, you could do that. Then there is this new one where you can select this. We'll come to that. Okay, so that's basically how the dashboard looks like. Okay. Now, in any system, any new software, whenever you're learning, the first thing that you need to know after knowing how to start this is how to quit the software. Okay, quitting is really important because just if you suppose make some mistake, you should be able to just leave it and start all over again. Okay, so always, whenever we, after starting, I always show how to leave it. So, how do I quit a Jupyter notebook? The way to quit Jupyter notebook is gracefully. If you want to quit, you have to hit the quit button here on the dashboard you have to hit the quit that is going to close jupyter notebooks all the jupyter notebooks and it's going to close the server also which is running don't leave it like this don't simply close the browser don't do it don't do it don't close jupyter like this don't close the browser tab that will still leave all the uh, this one notebook still running the server is still running okay the jupyter server the the, the kernel the jupyter kernel is still running so you should not do that always use click on quit okay Okay, coming back to this. Oops. So quitting Jupyter Notebook is done. Okay, so now elements of the Jupyter Notebook. First of all, like I said, it contains lots of kernels. So how do I access the kernels? You can access the kernel from the dashboard. Click on new, okay. Click on new, it'll, a drop down will come. And in the drop down, you'll find out under notebook. Right now, in my system, it is shown, it is showing under note, uh, notebook, it is showing me only Python 3 because only the Python 3 kernel is installed on my system. For Julia and R, they are not installed. Okay, so that's why it's showing me only Python 3. So if you want to you know, create a uh, notebook in using R programming language, then your R will come here. Okay, so you can uh, select your kernel this way. Or you could have a simple text file, or you could create a folder, or maybe you could start an instance of a terminal right from the dashboard here. So this is how you choose the kernel. Okay. Then you have the toolbar. Okay. This is the toolbar. Okay. What we see over here. This is the toolbar. The toolbar has got many options. So we have the main menu. There's a file, new notebook, and so on. You could just explore this. Then uh, you know you have you can edit the different cells. You could change the view of the uh, notebook you could insert cells above and below and show also show you the uh, shortcut if you want to insert a cell below okay i'll tell you what the cell is you can use uh, a if you want uh, above means a and below means b then the cells how you can run specific cells or a set of cells then uh, some commands for the kernel okay that is also available so all of this they're given right here in the main menu and there are some widgets will not be going into that okay and then there's some kind of a help external help this means this arrow going out this is an external help 
all this is available right here from the notebook itself okay so that's basically the uh, this uh, toolbar okay all right so now coming to the cells okay most important the cells this is what a cell is this is what a cell is okay so uh, let me go till the end this is what a cell is okay this is a cell and uh, what kind of content the cell is going to take you can actually control that you can control the contents of the cell okay you can control the contents of the cell it is a cell so how do you change the contents of the cell you can do that using this uh, option here the code okay so you click on code you, there's a drop down here then what kind of content you want to have whether you want to put some python code or you want to put some markdown or raw uh, text or you want to put a heading so you can choose all any of these four options okay so that's how you can change the cell type lastly closing a jupyter notebook okay closing a jupyter notebook never just like you don't close the dashboard from the browser never close the jupyter notebook from the browser again you have to do it gracefully because it has to close the server so the way to do that is you go to file okay and close and halt okay that is going to close the jupyter notebook okay so now the components of the jupyter notebook so jupyter notebook has got mainly three components as you can see again this is a cell okay let me just go here this is a cell you can see the moment i go here you see the option it is showing markdown that is the text okay the text which i am entering if you want a cell to contain only text then you select markdown if you want the cell to have python data you need to code okay you need to select code by default it is always code okay because it's actually meant for programming so now uh, jupyter notebook there are three components one is a web application which we are seeing here another one is the kernel okay so kernels are the uh, core of the programming language and the uh, notebooks themselves okay each of these notebooks so these are the three uh, components of the jupyter notebook then the, the types of cells that we have in jupyter notebook four types of cells as you can see here code markdown raw nb convert and heading code cells code cells are for input and output of live code that is run on the kernel markdown so this particular code this particular cell that i have chosen here this cell this cell this is actually a markdown cell as you can see from here in the markdown cell you can actually write and render plain text you can create lists you can add web links you can also add latex code you can also add latex code okay in fact this one is done using latex so all you need to do is those of you who had entered uh, who had uh, attended the previous workshop on latex you will know okay how do you add uh, latex code you just put dollar right so in, in between dollars in between the dollar dollar if i put a latex command it is going to render that also so like for example okay let's say if i want to put uh, let's say E equals mc square right e equals mc square okay see it is going to render latex code also so that's uh, the versatility of this then uh, suppose uh, you you want to you know uh, put uh, code without any formatting okay then you can select this one suppose you don't want any formatting to take place then you can choose a raw nb convert and then heading heading is same as markdown actually speaking these are all markdown only okay sorry markdown and heading they are just the same this is a heading type okay this is actually a heading type but heading is actually markdown only because they are one and the same okay so same as markdown cells so you can uh, mean mention uh, separate heading levels by using the hash sign so let me show you let me give a demo here so i'll select this as heading okay i'll select this as heading so i'll give you some prompt here this is okay heading okay then uh, below this markdown i can use markdown also to create headings this is subheading okay again let me add one more markdown triple hashes sub subheading and one more select markdown i could put four hash hashes okay so this will be a heading 
font has become smaller, even smaller, even smaller. Okay, so you can create your headings like this. Okay, you can also have bullet lists. You can also have bullet lists. You can use, you can create bullet lists using uh, the dash plus and star signs. It will give you three up to three levels, three levels of uh, bullets. You see, when I put a dash here, when I put a dash here, it is the outermost level. Okay, first item. Then you uh, you give a tab space, and after that you put a plus. This will be the sub item. Then another tab space from here, put a star here. That is going to give the first sub sub item. Okay, similarly here, and you can see the result here. So you can get these different levels of bullet lists in this way. Okay, now let's say uh, code highlighting important. So especially if you are supposed trying to teach uh, students some code. Okay, if you're trying to st teach students some code. Let's say I want to show some Python code. This is Python code. S equals welcome to WCP. I can actually show you this way. Let me just uh, create this one. So you see, this is a new cell. Okay, this is a new cell. By default, it is code. So let me just put the same line. Okay, so S equals welcome to WCP 2020. The same thing and print S. Okay, now if I run this you can see here it is giving me some output okay but can you put the code inside the markdown you generally you can't put you're not allowed to put the code inside the markdown so what you'll have to do is you have to tell the uh, you know uh, the notebook that what you're going to put is basically code so you can do that using back ticks back tick is uh, you know on your keyboard the key just above the tab button the key just above the tab button you will see a small line which is slanting line which is pointing towards the top left okay so that's a back tick so you put three back ticks you can have multi-level sun multi-level code if you want to put code within the same line itself you can just put whatever is the code this is the code print hello world that's the code you just surround that with one back tick before and one back tick after only one single back tick it will just put this inside the same line but if you put three back ticks like here one two three and then one two three here then if I don't mention Python, it won't know that this is Python. So it will not do any coloring. Okay, it will not do any coloring. But if I just mention that this is Python, then it knows that okay, this is a Python code. And when I run this, it will, you know, accordingly it will put some colors. Okay. So here it has put this as a red color. That means it's just a string. String is red color. Then this is a, a built-in function. This built-in function, it has color coded in green and so on. So I'm not really sure if we can use other languages. Let me just try. C++ and see if it works. Yeah, it works. Okay, for C++, the color coding is slightly different. Okay. So this is how you can actually include code within your text itself. You can include code. Uh, or of course, you can put the code. But if the cell is marked as code, that will also give you some output. And lastly, you can actually uh, uh, export the contents of Jupyter Notebooks into many different formats. So some of these formats are HTML. You could export this into LaTeX, PDF, and so on. So, on. so in fact, what I'm going to do is, uh, at the end of this workshop, at the end of uh, today's sessions, what I'm going to do is, this entire notebook, OK, I'm just going to export it. I'm going to just download it. By the way, you can have, see a print preview also, because this notebook can be printed also. You can just print it from here. OK, not from here. We have to download it as PDF. You can see here, this is how it is going to look like. If you want to print this, this is how it's going to look like. So now what I'm going to do is, you could download this as a PDF via LaTeX. Okay, So you can download this. It will download a PDF file. Let's give it a second. It's basically compiling whatever is in the notebook. It is compiling using LaTeX. It is compiling into a PDF file. And that PDF file will now be you know, it's creating this and I can down uh, save, it will be saved on my system. Once it is saved on my system, then I will be able to, uh, you know, view this. Okay. So, okay. Let me just, for the timing, let me just open with Firefox. This is how the PDF is going to look like. So everything that I have done here, you see, the text, the images, the code, everything is right here. Okay. So this is what I'm going to share with you all. This PDF file is what I'm going to share with you all. So when you access that Google shared Google Drive, you will find this PDF also. Okay, so that is basically a brief introduction to Jupyter Notebook. So it's now uh, twelve forty almost. So I think Alma, I think this is a good time to stop for lunch. Yeah, yeah yes, for that, I think so, we can stop. Yeah. So uh, in the in the next session after, uh, so let's break for how much time? Like forty-five minutes or one hour? 
how much would you say uh, now it is 1240 i think we can we can uh, we can join again at 12 uh, 130 i think 130 is 130. good 130 yeah. would be good okay yeah. so let's join again at 130 uh, so this completes the first topic okay which i had in mind that is introduction to jupiter notebook so you know have basic a basic idea of what a jupiter notebook is in the next session i will start straight head on i'll start with python okay so and of course i'll be doing uh, this with jupiter notebook only so you'll get to see actually how this works yeah, how you can actually do python so the more you go through this workshop more you'll understand jupiter notebook better so i don't have to actually spend hours and hours to explain what jupiter notebook is more you see me working on this uh, doing this python uh, uh, demonstration using jupiter notebook you will understand it even better so in the next uh, uh, lecture so we will start with the basics of python so that will be all for now maybe in yeah. the meantime some of us uh, oh, yeah yeah, print, yeah. download the jupiter notebook also yeah sure sure yeah then yeah. it will be good for students to practice yeah, sure. and another thing is for the afternoon we have a different link na no? Yes, for the afternoon, it's there in the manual. It's given. Yes, sorry, yes. it's given in the schedule. Uh, the same that link will be using. We are not going to use this link again. Yes, uh, uh, it's a for reminder the for the students, participants. We will be using a new link as per the uh, given in the schedule. Okay, so we'll meet at twelve thirty. Okay then. Yeah. Okay then. Let us meet again at twelve thirty. One thirty. Sorry, one thirty. Yes, one thirty. Okay then. See you again.